All righty, the gang's uh, all here. So uh, it is uh, 8.02 in the morning. Uh, this is Oliver Olson. I'm the chair of the State Board of Education. Um, I am going to call the meeting to order. Um, so we'll start with a, a roll call and then absent objection, uh, very slight modification of the agenda before we get to public to be heard, we will uh, introduce our, our newest uh, board member. So, um, Suzanne, I believe you're in mission control today. Yes, I am. Excellent. If you would be so kind as to call the roll. I will be happy to. Patrick Brown. Uh, present. Kim Gleason. Present. Good morning. Tammy Colby. Lyle Jepson. Tom Lovett. Present. Good morning. Gabrielle Lucci. Present. Jen, Jenna O'Farrell. Oliver Olson. Present. Jennifer Samuelson. Here. Good morning. Amara Severtson. Good morning. Present. Daniel French. Good morning. Here. Excellent. Um, so are there any other uh, amendments to the agenda? OK, uh, not hearing any. We, we will move on uh, to our uh, new addition, um, both literally and figuratively. Um, so Amara Stevenson, welcome. Uh, for those of us tuning in, Am Amara is, uh, uh, was recently appointed by Governor Scott to the State Board of Education. Uh, so we want to welcome you to the board. I'm very excited to have you. Uh, Amara, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Do you, uh, you wanna just say a little bit about yourself? Um, sure. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amara Stevenson. I live in Barrie. I'm a Barrie girl. I moved to Vermont about three years ago from Wisconsin. I, I go to Spalding and I'm in the Central Vermont Career Center studying cosmetology. I've competed in cosmetology and I have received many awards from being in cosmetology along with on my way to scholarships. So I'm very committed to wanting to do cosmetology. That's always been my dream. And I just love being outdoors and I love going on walks. That's pretty much all I have to say about myself. Excellent. Well, thank you. Welcome. Um, so, um, with that, our next agenda item is our first uh, op opportunity for uh, public to be heard. So uh, we uh, have made it a practice uh, to hear from the public at the beginning of the meeting, and also uh, there'll be another opportunity at the end of the meeting. So um, are there any members of the public with us today who wish to address the board? If so, uh, if you're in Teams, you can raise your hand using the the raise hand feature. If you're dialed in on the phone, um, I believe you press star five. And I see um, Kate LaRose, so stand by. Let me see if anyone else wishes to address the board. Um, so at this point, uh, Suzanne, unless I'm missing anything, I believe Kate is the only member of the public who has uh, identified herself. So um, Ms. LaRose, um, you have the floor if you like to say something. Yes, hi, good morning. My name is Kate LaRose. I am a former AOE employee and have a child who is high risk for COVID complications. And recently we had to move from Canaan, Vermont to a new school district in order to ensure access to learning for my child. In offering public comment today, I bring with me an understanding of what my child needs, what the law requires, and what the obligation of the AOE ought to be. Yesterday, the CDC revised their COVID-19 guidelines. Part of the rationale cited in doing so is that 95% of Americans have acquired some form of immunity. Yet even within their revisions, they underscored the need for schools to protect in-person instruction for high-risk students, citing the federal requirements for schools to abide by civil rights law. I am here today to implore that the State Board of Education not neglect its duty to the other 5%. Students are immune compromised and de desperately need access to safe in-person instruction. Listed among the State Board of Education's responsibilities in Title 16, Chapter 3 of the Vermont Statutes is the duty to ensure access, equal access for all Vermont students to a quality education. 
In the world of special education and civil rights law, which is education law, all means all. Over the past two years of weekly field memos, special education pearls, and AOE COVID webpage guidance, including the joint memo that went out from Secretary French and Commissioner Levine on August 10th to school nurses, not once has there even been so much as a footnote indicating that state COVID guidance does not supersede federal civil rights when it comes to ensuring that students with IEPs and 504s be provided a free appropriate public education, regardless of the severity of their civility. The consistent silence from Vermont's public health and education agencies has moved beyond, beyond, beyond benign neglect and into the territory of intentional discrimination against an entire class of children who are at high risk of harm from COVID-19 during an ongoing pandemic. During the few times that messaging from Secretary French did go out to local education agencies, the guidance was often counter to federal law, stating or leaving LEAs with the impression that mask requirements are preempted. As a result, hundreds, if not thousands, of Vermont students have been denied FAPE, pushed out of public education, and have experienced disproportionate harm on the basis of their disability. The messaging from the feds has been consistent. In a March 24th letter to educators and parents, Secretary Cardona wrote, as we enter this next phase of pandemic response, we urge schools to lead with equity and inclusion to ensure all students have access to in-person learning alongside peers. The letter goes on to state that children who are high risk of complications from COVID may need additional protections to ensure that they can remain safe in the classroom and specifically cites masking of staff and peers as a reasonable classroom modification to ensure compliance with federal law. The letter highlights IEP and 504 processes as a means to protect access to in-person learning for such students. Emails to Secretary French and Commissioner Levine begging for that this message be amplified to nurses, educators, and families in Vermont went unanswered. Messaging from DOE, OCR, and CDC about protecting the right to safe in-person instruction for high-risk students was never shared, nor were the processes families have available as recourse. I request that the State Board of Education direct the AOE to take the following corrective actions before the start of the school year. One, provide the board with a briefing on the implications of not meeting FAPE for immune compromised and high-risk students from Special Education Director Dr. Keller. Two, ensure that school nurses, administrators, and any staff who serve on 504 and IEP teams receive messaging that statewide COVID guidance does not supersede their requirements to provide students with their civil rights under federal law. Three, Offer training and technical assistance to school teams charged with creating plans to preserve in-person learning for immune compromised students during one of the most dangerous phases of the pandemic to date for these students. And four, amplify to the field the consistent federal messaging that reasonable classroom modifications for such students may include masking regardless of statewide guidance. Throughout the pandemic, our child was denied FAPE. This spanned no or limited access to instruction, time spent in seclusion away from peers, having to drive four hours a day to access a school that would provide in-person instruction and ultimately moving. No other child or family should have to experience this. We were told by our previous district that but for the messaging from AOE and subsequent clarifying conversations with Secretary French, our child would have been provided with access to safe in-person instruction at their school. Later in the agenda, you will hear from Secretary French on agenda item I regarding school safety and COVID-19 variants. On the website, no plan is presented in compliance with public meeting laws, so we cannot know what his presentation will include. But as you listen today, you will have the opportunity to ask Dr. French questions, and I offer the following for your consider wait, your following questions for your consideration. Where does his proposed guidance align with and where does it stray from federal CDC, DOE, and OCR guidance, as well as messaging from BISBIT regarding provision of faith and civil rights issues for immune compromised students? How does this plan accomplish the rules you just passed for special education pertaining to program options and special education services? Ask Dr. French to share with you the reasons why the US DOE determined in June 2021 that Vermont AOE needs intervention in meeting the needs of students with disabilities under Section 616 of IDEA, and also ask why the required postings for the Federal Review of Special Education have still not been posted to the website for the public, which should have happened within 120 days. By taking these steps and asking these questions, you can help ensure that disproportionate harm to students with disabilities does not continue and that school teams will have the support they need to provide faith to medically vulnerable students. Please don't shirk your responsibility in ensuring that all Vermont students have equal access to a quality education because all means all. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, it, it, uh, do you have, would you happen to have those in writing? It looks like you were reading from something yeah. if you 
if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing that with the board, uh, that that would be helpful. There's a lot of information there and it would be great to have that in writing. Yes, I will do so. Wonderful, I appreciate it. Um, and as you noted, we do have uh, this as an agenda item. We'll hear from uh, Secretary French um, later on. Um, so any other comments, uh, from members of the public who wish to address the board? Okay, I'm not hearing or, or seeing anyone uh, wishing to be recognized. So uh, we will now uh, transition on to our next item of business um, and we'll circle back in case any other members of the board, or any other members of the public join us before 8.20. Um, but item C is to review and approve uh, the minutes of our July 20th uh, meeting. So uh, at this time I would entertain a motion I will move that we approve the um, minutes from our July 20th, 2022 meeting. I second this, Patrick. OK, it's been moved and uh, by Jennifer Samuelson and seconded by Patrick Brown to uh, adopt uh, the minutes of July 20th, 2022. Is there any discussion? OK, not seeing any. All those in favor of adopting uh, the motion to approve the minutes of July 20th, 2022. Please signify by saying yes and raising your hand. And Amara, just uh, this will be new to you, but you're as a non-voting member, um, you you participate in all this, all of all of the discussion, um, but you don't actually uh, uh, vote. So, um, just in case you were wondering. So, all those in favor of adopting um, the motion, please signify by saying yes and raising your hand. Yes. 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 And those opposed, please raise your hand and signify by saying no. Are there any abstentions? It appears that the motion has carried unanimously and the motion has carried unanimously and you've approved the minutes of July 20th. Um, and Amara, you're in good company, by the way, because the secretary also does not have a vote. So, um, with that, uh, another call for um, uh, public comment. If there are any members of the public who wish to address the board, you can raise your hand or press star five if you're dialed in. Um, so not seeing any, uh, we'll move on to board uh, announcements. Are there any members of the board who have any comments or updates not on the otherwise on the agenda? Um, we can then turn to our student report. So, Gabrielle. Um, school has not started for me yet, so I really don't have very much to report, but I'm sure next year, uh, next year, I'm sorry, next <laughs> month, <laughs> I'll have plenty to share. But um, I don't know if I should take this time to, like, explain to Amara what the student report is or... Is there yeah. anything? Yeah, OK. That, that'd be um, great. So welcome again, Amara. Um, it's really exciting to have you here. Um, the student report is essentially where we as student board members just give brief reports of what is happening in our school community, and it helps out the board to understand what's going on from a student perspective. Did I essentially cover that? You covered it. OK. That's great. Um, have you uh, have you picked out all your? I assume you've picked out all your class classes for the upcoming year. I have. I haven't received my schedule yet, but I'm waiting for it to come in the mail. Excellent. Anything um, exciting, challenging that you're looking forward to, or AP Psych? That's going to be fun. Very exciting. Yes. Cool. Alrighty. Um, Oh, Patrick. Oh, I was just going to ask, um, is this your senior year? Gabrielle? Yes. yes, it is. Oh, so it's an exciting year. Uh, I hope so. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Excellent. Um, 
So with that, uh, I'll, I'll go back and just see if there are any members of the public. Oh, Kim. Thank you. Um, and Gabrielle was spot on on the student reports, and we're always so grateful to hear perspective from our students. And we have had a couple of occasions where the students were interested in particular projects or subjects where um, the, the outreach for feedback went um, into other arenas to bring a broad perspective on student mental health. And um, so if, if between the two of you, there's anything we can do to support any particular area of interest, um, please certainly let us know. And I think we'd be happy to support you. Um, so maybe we'll schedule a time outside of the meeting to have a chat and just um, see how we could support what you might like to amplify in your time with us. Thanks. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Gabrielle, I appreciate the quick update. And um, Amara, I don't know if you want to take this time to sort of tack on like when you're going back to school and anything that you're excited about this upcoming year. Um, I'm sure you may not have anything prepared, but if you want to jump in, that'd be awesome. Well, I'm going into my second year of cosmetology this year. I'm pretty excited about it because this year we get to run our full salon, get the full experience of, you know, what's what it's like to work in a salon, which is pretty exciting. I am i don't take any other classes besides cosmetology, which is going to be really great because last year I took other classes and then cosmetology. So it's going to be a lot easier to manage my time. And I go back August 30th. So I'm pretty excited for this year. Hopefully it's going to be a great year. Um, so unless there are any other questions uh, or comments from board members, um, I'll do one final call for public comment, um, but not not seeing any, and I don't think anyone else joined us. So um, with that, uh, I think we can um, take up item F, which is an update on the uh, EQS rulemaking committee. So Kim. Good morning. Um, our group continues to meet and we are working through definitions. Um, they're foundational to the document. And I think probably um, is for me anyway, it's taking longer than we might have thought, but really purposeful, intentional work to get those right. And we do expect that the next meeting to be done with any modifications to the proposed language on the definitions, and then be able to move on to the, the sort of body of content in the standards. And we've identified wanting to um, get some feedback from practitioners in the various um, subject matter areas. So we we are going to be pulling together a list of folks that might be able to join us coming up. We st still anticipate and intend to have a final draft out of our committee, and I think it is likely to be later than the end of September, but um, to then hold at least one public hearing for people to offer us their thoughts and reactions to that version of the draft, and then we can take that in and make any additional modifications before the full board um, will be, you know, asked to consider it and then it will move through the formal process. So we're doing what we can to take in as much feedback and ensure clarity in the language to have it be able to be operationalized. So Tom, anything else or Gabrielle? No, you covered it well, Kim. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's it's a really interesting, challenging body of work, and I think exciting to see um, a, a lens that um, can support all students, um, perhaps a little differently than the old EQS did. So I think Great. we're enjoying the work. Thank you. And, and Amara, for your benefit, um, what we, our board has, um, so much work on our plate and, and a, a great deal of responsibilities what we uh what we do what we tend to do is um 
we, we establish co uh, committees of the board. So sm uh, smaller groups of, of members of the board um, who are tasked with some of these bigger, uh, some of these bigger projects that require more effort and more focus on, on that particular area. So we uh, at any one time we have between two and three, sometimes four different committees. I'm trying, I'm losing track of them now uh, that um, and, and some are standing committees. So Tom Lovett is chairing one committee as an example, it's a standing committee that um, is evaluating independent school um, uh, approvals. Uh, Kim and Tammy are co-chairing this EQS committee that that um, uh, Kim just provided an update on. Um, and uh, we uh, I was chairing a committee that um, is going to be reporting out in a little bit. Um, that will be it was a very short uh, um, uh, time frame for this committee, so it actually uh, it's its work is is going to be complete as of today. And uh, I think there might be a few other committees, but anyway, that's that's essentially how we organize uh, our our work. Uh, so for those things that can't that require more time than we can dedicate in a meeting, we we delegate uh, that work out to different committees. So. I'm realizing Oliver, I guess it says it in the agenda, but yep. EQS is Ed Quality Standards. So they are sort of a foundational document to guide the work that happens in schools and in education systems um, for students. So. Yep. OK, any um, questions or comments for Kim? OK. Um, so I think with that we can move on to item uh, G. We're a little ahead of schedule. Um, so Tom, um, I'll I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. So um, our committee met this week. We received updates um, about uh, Vitality, which is you remember they uh, needed to um, bring their facilities up to code before the opening of school, and they are communicating with the AOE about that. Uh, we also received a list of independent school programs um, in um, in different areas so that we knew where uh, where the capacity was in different parts of the state. Uh, we heard from three schools. Uh, one school we have deferred action on until uh, October so that the AOE and that school can resolve some uh, disagreements about um, communications that have happened over the over the past uh, few months. Um, but we do have two schools um, that we are bringing before the full board. Um, and the first one is fairly easy. Um, you have the green sheet for Maple Hill. Um, uh, Ma Maple Hill is uh, recommended for a renewal of five years and um, a supplementary addition to their uh, application of adding grades four through six. Um, the report from the AOE uh, talked about exceptional compliance in several areas. Um, they are still working with um, the AOE on some areas of IEP implementation and service logs um, and co consultation of special educators with general education teachers. But overall, the report on Maple Hill um, was very good. And so um, the first thing I'd like to bring before the board is um, that the board adopt the secretary's recommended action. And that is that the State Board of Education grant renewal of general and special education, independent school approval and disability categories of intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, developmental delay, traumatic brain injury, multiple disabilities, emotional disturbance, specific learning disabilities and other health impairment. In addition to approve the addition of an upper elementary program for grades four through six to Maple Hill School in Plainfield, Vermont to serve grades four through 12. This approval is conditional on the requirement that the school reports to the agency of education within five business days whenever any changes occur in enrollment programs, policies, facilities, financial capacity, staffing or administration during the approval period. So I, I would like to make that motion um, to the full board. OK, uh, so you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Uh, Kim? 
Is there um, so the motions been made and seconded? Is there any uh, discussion? OK, not hearing any. All those in favor of uh, adopting the motion as stated, please signify by saying yes and raising your hand. Yes. Yes. And those opposed, uh, please signify by saying no and raising your hand. Are there any abstentions? It appears that the motion has carried unanim unanimously and uh, the motion in fact has carried unanimously. So um, wonderful. Thank you, Tom. And, and actually, uh, as you mentioned, green sheet, um, I, I, I'm a I imagine Amara is probably wondering what, what a green sheet is. So if you wouldn't uh, mind, Tom, uh, maybe just providing a, a brief explanation of what a, what a green sheet is. A uh, green sheet is uh, named for the color paper that it used to be printed on. Um, is, uh, it is uh, from um, the school finance team at the Agency of Education. And, um, and it has a secretary's recommended action and then the statutory authority and different findings um, regarding that authority that back up why the action is being uh, recommended. And so that's provided to, um, to the state board for, um, as you just heard, a recommenda recommendation. Um, our committee, the uh, school approval committee, hears from the schools in a separate meeting um, receiving the Agency of Education report and then uh, any documents from the school and then we engage uh, with the schools around those reports and recommendations. But the green sheet is what comes before the full board. Great, thank you, Tom. Okay, um, next. Yes, we do have a, a second school that is um, representative of a class of schools and is a little bit more complicated. Uh, Mount Snow Academy is uh, a winter sports academy. Um, so it does, doesn't operate um, for the whole year, but only for the winter sports season. Um, they were re asking to uh, renew their approval and um, add grades four and five. Um, the report from the agency staff stated that it was um, in compliance with all rules, except for the new rule, 2227, which requires those schools operating a boarding program to be accredited or uh, licensed by DCF. Um, as this rule has just been um, adopted, uh, Mount Snow did not have enough time to get accreditation. Um, and so the, um, the conversation was, what do we do with the school? Because um, everything else was in compliance. The only reason um, stated in the report for not granting um, approval would be not meeting this new rule, 2227. Um, so after a lot of discussion in the committee, um, we are recommending that uh, we conditionally waive Rule 2227, the conditions being that we receive written statements from an accrediting agency and Mount Snow is using ASNI, um, the o in the Association of Independent Schools in, no in New England, that they are actively engaged in the process that they're making good progress in the process and that there is a definite timeline for them to complete the process towards accreditation. Um, also, in addition, that in the meantime, we receive evidence of compliance with the intent of Rule 2227, which was for student uh, health and safety and the quality of the residential program. Um, so um, the, the recommendation I'm going to make um, is that the state board um, grant approval um, to Mount Snow Academy and the addition of grades four and five um, based on the evidence that they comply with everything um, uh, I'm going to want to get this right uh, that they comply with all all uh, appropriate rules except for Rule 2227. Um, I'm recommending that the state board waive 2227 upon the condition that we receive written statements from ASNI that the school is engaged in the accreditation process, making good progress in that process, and have a timeline for when they will complete that process. In addition, that they provide evidence of 
compliance with the intent of 2227, which it specifically would be substantial compliance with ASNI standards number five on student health and well-being, uh, seven residential program, and four uh, student safety um, infrastructure. So uh, if uh, I would also say that this approval is conditional on the requirement that the school reports to the agency of education within five business days, whenever any changes occur in enrollment programs, policies, facilities, financial capacity, staffing, or administration during the approval period. So um, you've heard uh, the motion. Is there a second to the motion? And I see your hand is up, Jennifer. I don't know if that's the second or if you have a question. So maybe I can we should. Do both. I, I can second it and then I have some questions. <laughs> OK, so uh, so I'll take that as a second so we can get the, the motion on the table uh, for discussion. And uh, so the motion has been made and seconded. Um, so uh, uh, discussion, uh, Jennifer. Thanks. Um, so, Tom, I appreciate the work that your committee is doing on this, and I realize that, um, you know, certainly the the changes that we made to the 2200 series, um, you know, with some of them going into effect immediately, um, I realize like the accreditation process takes some time. Um, so I am sensitive to that, but I'm wondering, you know, just looking at the timeline, it's a little bit hard to tell, but like, do they literally just start the process with ASNI? I mean, it, it doesn't seem like they're very far down the road at all um, in in terms of you know seeking accreditation. So I don't um, I don't know that specifically. I know that ASNI will have received enough information from the school in order to um, take them up as a candidate for accreditation at the September 20th meeting. So there will there must have been some kind of um, communication with ASNI to allow them to get on that agenda. Um, and then they'll be accepted as a candidate for accreditation. And then there's um, the whole process that a um, ASNI laid out in that letter um, that would grant them accreditation in the spring of 2024. So substantively, um, it doesn't sound like there's a whole lot. Like, ha has the subcommittee heard from ASNI? Yeah, uh, we received an email saying that they are uh, actively in, uh, engaged in the process mm -hmm. uh, and that they um, provided a timeline. Um, as September 20th, 2022, they will um, grant uh, candidate status. Um, they will go through a year long uh, self-study year 23 to 24 school year in the winter of 24 um, there will be an on-site accreditation visit by ASNI and then in the spring of 24 when they're um, when ASNI's board meets they will uh, grant accreditation at that time okay so I guess I mean what I'm hearing is sort of the procedure that is being proposed but it doesn't really get to the substance of the accreditation itself and I guess you know considering the changes that we I, I would feel more comfortable with this if there were more substance to back up um, the accreditation by ASNI and I feel like you know, with our 2200 subcommittee, um, you know, although ASNI was only officially acknowledged and written into the rules um, effective this spring, you know, in the subcommittee beginning, you know, really February of 2021, um, I feel like we did sort of telegraph pretty clearly that that was our intent that ASNI was going to be included um, so that schools could start, you know, working with ASNI if they were so inclined, certainly before the rules went into effect. I guess I'm a little bit troubled by the fact that we are looking to approve a school that is at the very beginning of this procedural accreditation process without having a better understanding of whether substantively they would be accredited. Right. So, so my, um, the, that's where the second um, part, second condition um, of my of my motion came in. So I would like to um, ask the school to give us evidence that they substantially comply with 
um, standard five, which is student well-being. And I'll just give you this, not, I won't give you the indicators, I'll just re uh, read what the standard says. Uh, the school fosters physical, emotional, and mental health, safety, and well-being through its programs and services. That they also um, substantially comply with standard seven, which is residential homestay and exchange programs. The school uh, school's residential homestay and or exchange programs provide a caring, thoughtfully planned and mission consistent experience for students. And then standard set 14, which is safety and risk management. The school implements policies and procedures that promote a safe and healthy school environment consistent with its mission and as a comprehensive approach to risk, risk management. Um, there are several indicators under each one of those that the school could use to identify the evidence they would provide. But um, I think if they do show evidence of substantial compliance with those standards, which will, they'll have to in order to get accredited by um, ASNI eventually, um, this would um, show that they comply with the intent of 2227 um, without having um, to close down or not receive um, students based on a rule that just went into effect this July. But they haven't submitted that information yet, correct? They didn't know they had to. They didn't know they had to. I mean, so, that's a recommendation. I mean, I'm almost wondering if it would make sense to um, table this and give them some time to be able to come back with that. Um, just so, substantively, we have more to go on. I'm just, I'm really uncomfortable um, approving something. Like, I, I would just want more information before making that decision. And that was a conversation that we had um, because by tabling it, their um, current approval remains in effect. Um, and so um, the, our question was, would it be better to get that evidence? Um, and we could table it until we have the evidence, but in that case, their current approval remains in effect. And I, and I am sensitive to the tabling. It does implicate their ability to roll in fourth and fifth. But I mean, as I sit here today, I just don't feel like I have enough information to be able to um, you know, vote in favor of approving. And they were approved before this new rule went into effect. The only thing they don't have is accreditation. But um, how many, um, do, do we have a sense for how many boarding, how, how large is their boarding program um, on one? Because so I think where I'm going in, in my mind is um, based on that letter, it sounds like they're very early in the uh, accreditation process and it's it's going to take a few years so in my mind, I'm going back and forth between, you know, should they should they be a, a, a recognized school while they go through this accreditation process? If the boarding program is really key to what they do, um, or perhaps if the boarding program is is not a significant part of what they do, you know, maybe they hold off on on operating a boarding program until they have that accreditation. I I, I don't know. I'm sort of going back and forth on this one a little bit. I have I, I have a um, I'll just say it. I have a problem with denying a school approval, having just implemented a rule in July that they had no chance, even if they had started in January, they would not have been able to comply with this rule. Um, they would not have their accreditation by this point. So I think that we will need to, there are going to be more schools in this, um, in this uh, category I think it's reasonable that if we ask them to show evidence of compliance with the intent of 2227, knowing they don't have the time in order to actually comply with it, that makes that makes sense to me, and I did to the committee. So, one question I'd like I'd like to know. I, I hear you, Tom, and I, I if if because I remember I was back in that committee. It was uh, you know a year and a half ago they came in and and they raised this as an issue as a potential issue and they indicated that they were they were they were going to pursue accreditation so if in fact they pursued accreditation shortly after that meeting and for some reason you know they're, they're still going through the process that would be one thing but if they didn't take any action until very recently i'm struggling with that a little bit because we they 
they came and they testified and we spoke with them a year and a half ago as we were contemplating this rule. So my approach to this personally would be very different depending on what actions they took based on where we were headed. But that's just my perspective. Kim? Thank you. I share those concerns. This is like waiving and setting a standard that we would be waiving this requirement doesn't feel okay without the evidence that you're suggesting they might produce. It's hard to know where they are in their process, but it seems as though if they had asked a year and a half ago to be a candidate, they'd be almost done. And I think there is another path as well, right? They, I, I don't know the timeline for being approved by DCF, but I mean, I, I know that we had a number of reasons to be addressing 2200, but certainly not the least of which was concern regarding residential programs. And, and it was, um, it was, appropriately proactive, but also in response to concerns that had come up in the field. So I would be uncomfortable and won't be able to vote to approve today. I think that which um, we're saying is the evidence they'll give us, then it should be tabled until they give us the evidence. Um, and that is even still waiving the accreditation. And maybe maybe somebody knows, maybe Dan, I don't know if you might know, is what is the DCF process like? This isn't their only path. And ASNI was newly approved as an accreditation option, but there are other accrediting agencies. Yeah, and I think um, <clears throat> I think the DCF piece is more uh, related to residential uh, sort of therapy and treatment schools, so I don't think that would be necessarily an appropriate um, oversight mechanism thank you and i and i'm i would be fine with tabling this and, t and allowing the school to present the evidence that i suggest um according to the standards that um that i listed um because i think what we, what we are concerned about is less about the responsiveness of the school to what they might, should have seen coming down the track and more about the quality of the school and the experience of the students and I think we can, in good faith, um, feel good about the quality of education if they provide evidence of compliance in those three standards. Yep. So if we, if we could table us and, and to get a little bit more information, I think that would be helpful. And also, um, I do think it would be important to to get a a, a legal opinion, perhaps from Emily, on whether we have the authority to, and I know we can grant sort of conditional, but I, I want to make sure that we're not exceeding our authority. Um, so I, I also have some questions around that, and I'm just very sensitive to this because there was so much concern about um, residential programs and schools over the past few years, and we made representations, we being, you know, the Jennifer on behalf of the board to LCAR um, around these rules um, and, and our intent. And I'm sensitive to the fact that, you know, a member of, of LCAR also happens to be the chair of a, 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 um, a, a committee in the Senate that took extensive testimony and spent a lot of time talking about residential programs at schools and, and concerns. And I distinctly remember Emily Simmons providing testimony and referencing this rule in our intent to, um, you know, protect the, the safety of students in, in residential programs. So I just want to be really very careful that we're not exceeding our, our legal authority and that we're true to the intent that we've represented to the General Assembly. Um, Sorry, Kim. Thanks, Oliver. I appreciate that would be helpful in considering a, even a conditional approval um, at another date. And I think um, maybe this is obvious, but after that um, evidence has come forward, can we have the agency offer us any opinion 
so another green sheet, if you will, based on that evidence coming in. Um, I think that would be helpful for our consideration. It might also weave in the ability or authority, whether or not we have it, to consider waiving that requirement. Um, the indicators will be important. I think we as a lay board um, may or may not be able to um, digest or weigh in on the whether the evidence provided is adequate for the the um, conditions being sought. So basically just another AOE review when we get the evidence. Is that fair to ask? Any other discussion, comments, questions? Um, so there is a there is a, a motion on the table right now to approve. I think what I was hearing in the discussion is a, a desire to table for the for the moment, uh, so, uh, so the committee can have some make some further inquiries. Can I ask just a procedural question? Should we? vote down this motion because the next when we are asked to approve later will it be the same motion it could be a different it could be a different motion depending on on the work of the committee so i i would suggest perhaps maybe the simplest thing tom is uh um, unless you want to put it up for a vote maybe is to withdraw the motion and then the, the committee can go back and and continue the, with the work and that way we're not and, and the motion that uh, uh, happy happy to withdraw this motion if the the motion that the board seeks is to table this until we receive more information. That I think I think by withdrawing it is a, it's effectively tabled and you know back in the in, in the hands of your committee. That way okay. we're not prejudice, prejudice, prejudicing anything here. Okay. I will uh, then I then I will withdraw the motion. Uh, absent objection, uh, the, the motion is uh, withdrawn. Um, alrighty. Any other, um, anything else from your committee, Tom? Uh, no, and to, to be clear then, uh, we should be in communication with Mount Snow that they should um, appear before our committee at, um, at another meeting as soon as possible um, to to discuss this matter. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, Alrighty. So that brings us to um, uh, item H, uh, district quality standards. So, Dan, did you or someone else from the agency wish to uh, review this? Yeah, I will. Uh, good morning. Um, and this is somewhat related to uh, an upcoming agenda item as well on pupil weights. Um, the the authorization to do the work on district quality standards is in that statute, Act 127. So I uh, just want to discuss with the board and sort of warm you up uh, to this topic. Um, as you heard, uh, Kim gave an update on the, the education quality standards work. We have a related project uh, on district quality standards uh, that the agencies have uh, been charged to work on. We're in the process of um, creating a scope of work for that project, timelines and so forth. Um, there is a uh, requirement that the state board adopt um, a communications plan for the agency as it begins engaging in that process. So uh, just want to alert you to that. Um, what I was thinking is that we would bring to you at a subsequent meeting um, sort of an outline of the work and the proposed timeline and so forth to give you a sense of what the work would be in, entail. And then uh, then the board would um, use that as a basis to develop a communications plan to guide the agency's rulemaking process. I will say there are. Um, we envision there under this idea of district quality standards to be standards related to school district governance. And um, we've already engaged uh, with the school boards association to see if they would like to lead that with their uh, association and they've agreed to do that. So some of the work is underway, but we uh, as a team we're meeting to sort of lay out a complete scope of the project and uh, we could do that at a subsequent meeting of the board. 
prior to you engaging in a conversation around a, a communications plan for the agency. Uh, Kim? Thanks so much. Um, can you remind us, Dan, the timeline? I know that um, we were, I don't know where this is gonna intersect with EQS, but I think our intent was to try and align timing. And I was recalling that the law may have prescribed timeline for you. Yes, it does. Uh, February 2023, uh, the agency has to present the rules. Um, so that's it is a fairly compressed timeline considering, uh, you know, this is uncharted ter territory to a certain extent. We don't have a model to work with, um, but I think it's a significant opportunity as well. Um, so we're, we're anxious to really begin the work. Thank you. And the intersection. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I, just, I don't know. I know we've earlier on had had a conversation and as this is fleshed out, if we have a better sense of whether these touch live within stand beside the ed quality standards, that'll be helpful to understand as well. If we're referencing them, you know, within each of those documents that um, we probably are do as you evolve your thinking for another meeting on that question, I think. Yeah, I think there will be organizational issues to the rules that we'll have to address. I think um, as we did with the special ed rules, you know, making decisions based on as the content becomes clearer, well, let's pull the financial rules out as a separate section, that kind of thing. We also have a you know, general theme for me on district standards is areas of district operation that districts have responsibility for. Um, for which we don't have quality standards, but we do already in regulation have standards on things like school facilities that we might want to consider folding under a container called district quality standards. Um, but yeah, I think there'll, we'll, we'll get into those uh, sort of editorial cons considerations as we get a better understanding of what the content would be. Great, thank you. Um, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, so, Dan, I'm just wondering if you can briefly, I mean, you sort of touched on it a little bit, but can you just explain what the district quality standards are and how they differ from, you know, other standards that are currently in place? Like, what what is this seeking to address? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, conceptually, I'll, you know, at a very high level, say, you know, we've... Um, you know, we've been through No Child Left Behind Act and the idea of state level accountability systems, I think everyone understands to a certain extent. And um, there's a lot of interest. I mean, our central goal is to improve the quality of education of students for all students. And a lot happens between state accountability systems and what goes on in the classroom. And, you know, in your issues of your conversations with like with Addison County governance and so forth, there's a lot of variability in Vermont in that operational layer, sort of what happens between state level accountability in the classroom. So what we've noticed by looking at other states is they generally have quality standards in the space of district operations. And I should say that when I talk about Act 27, there's a related piece here around quality assurance regulations as well. So how do we ensure that more more times out of more often than not that districts have high quality processes in place so areas of operation like financial management districts and think think of some of the topics we've engaged in with the independent school regulation you know what are what are the standards for financial operation hr operation uh, we have some instructional systems that have been delegated to school districts such as coordination of curriculum, uh, local assessment plans, needs-based professional development, and uh, multi-tiered systems of support. So thinking about what what those responsibilities are at the district level, what are the standards for operation, um, and then how would we provide a quality assurance process uh, for the agency, but describing that all in regulation is essentially the, the work, I think. So is this kind of more looking at like the the structure of the educational you know framework within the district and not necessarily like the content of the education or does that play into it as well? Yeah, I think that's to Kim's point. There is an interrelationship between the content piece, which is really I think the ed quality standards bucket, 
but how they how they achieve that quality, the processes involved, the sort of the basic elements of uh, quality operation of a school district, which have a significant impact on the district's uh, reliability of achieving those educational outcomes. So that's that's kind of what we're heading into is to under, understand that, describe that in a way uh, that would assist uh, school districts, uh, not only from a quality assurance standpoint, but also from us guiding our support functions at the agency. Um, but I think that's that's the piece where um, a lot of other states have regulatory uh, constructs. We don't seem to have that, and um, I think it's it's overdue. I think you know it's one of my, part of my thinking as a result of Act 46 is this is an area where we should lean into a bit as a state. Thanks. And I, I will say when I talk about 127, part of this conversation emerged from a conversation around the pupil weight revision. So uh, a question that came up immediately in that conversation is if we if we make adjustments to uh, how how we allocate funding to school districts, what assurance will we have that that additional funding actually leads to improved outcomes? And that's where the conversation of you know needing to improve the regulatory construct around district quality uh, came up, and that's why it's embedded in Act 127. Thanks. And I I would point out uh, some of this um, the the this, the law around district quality standards came to be it developed during the legislative session, but it didn't really all fully gel until sort of the waning hours so there is um it's a little confusing reading the law and and uh we've had some discussion trying to trying to resolve this so it's it's the way it's written it's it's less than perfect um and and keep me honest here dan because it's been a few months since we looked at this but my recollection is that the legislature directed the AOE to take the lead on these district quality standards, but it's sort of part of, it's like a sub chapter of the ed quality standards, which the board still has responsibility for. So part of what Kim was speaking about with the, the intersection between the two is you have a specific deadline, you as in the agency has a deadline to prepare these district quality standards, but the way this the law is written, it's part of the ed quality standards, which we as a board still have responsibility for. So we have to work pretty closely to make all this happen. Yeah, we um, you know, we had that conversation uh, with Oliver and Kim. The law specifically references the ed it doesn't mention district quality standards. It says education quality standards, but that was, you know, sort of a last minute sort of uh, typo, if you will. Um, the intent was there all along, so uh, we don't we don't have any trouble, I think, sorting out that work. But yep. again, the, the idea of district quality standards will be new new regulatory uh, information. So we're um, it's a little different process in that we're not revising stuff that's already on the books. We're actually creating a new body of rules, and uh, again, you know, uh, figuring out how to do the quality assurance process and regulation, which doesn't exist either. So. Um, I, I think it's our committee's commitment to to align with your timing, Dan, as well, so that um, as we all know, if the rules are open, the rules are open. So if it should have intersection and reference with any QS, however it ends up, it we want to be on the same timeline. So that that is our target too. Um, and I appreciated the parallel or the the reference to the way the financial piece came out of 173 and became, I think, 1300 or it became a separate set of rules. So that that's resonating for me, this notion that they could live beside one another and likely reference one another, but not necessarily have to be embedded within ed quality um, under that umbrella and might live separately. So uh, thank you for that example, because that helps me um, conceptualize it in a way that we've got, a, we did, it, it happened in that way in another set, so thanks. Anything else, um, Dan? 
No, that's I'll, I'll touch on it a bit when I talk about the pupil weights, um, but that's uh, unless the board had any other questions, that's pretty much all I had to share on that. So we'll be okay. coming back to you with a scope of work. And I would suggest just the logic is once you had a and, and we have a better understanding of kind of what what's involved content wise, um, what are the moving pieces of it? Uh, you will have the sort of new requirement for the board also to develop a community engagement process for the agency um, to do that. So, um, but I think that makes sense to me that you have an understanding of the project first, because I think the, I, what we were talking about in terms of community engagement around agency rulemaking was really dependent on what are the specific rules that are under adoption. You can imagine like special education rules would require a different community engagement process than um, transportation rules, for example. So, okay. Um, Suzanne, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, I did just receive an email from someone who uh, is in the waiting room, so I don't know if you could check the waiting room and make sure anybody who's there can be admitted. Um, so I think that brings us to item I. Um, again, back to you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, so item I is uh, the back to school update. Uh, the board had asked um, to have this on the agenda. Um, coincidentally, we did publish our back to school memo. Um, Dr. Levine and I did that jointly. It's this year. It's uh, the communication is largely uh, and specifically directed to school nurses. Um, we published that in the afternoon on Wednesday. We included it in the agenda packet earlier this morning, so uh, that's referenced for your review. Um, I can summarize it a bit and then uh, if you have any questions. The um, primarily the memo uh, is a direction to uh, leverage the clinical decision making of nurses and how to inform that. A little different than prior the prior two years where uh, you know certainly in the first year we had comprehensive guidance under the construct of an emergency order of the governor. So essentially that guidance func functioned as regulation. And last year, um, the guidance certainly was far narrower, not under a state of emergency, and really leveraged uh, the local authority of school boards to uh, and and their responsibility to keep their schools safe. Uh, this year, we started working with the school nurses. The health department did fairly early in the process. Um, we wanted to deal essentially with this issue of symptomatic individuals in schools, and uh, you know, so much comes back to. Um, leveraging their clinical decision making relative to what extent symptoms are are severe enough, if you will, uh, that students should say in school. S students have a head cold, for example, uh, many times under back in the day when we didn't have good testing or uh, vaccination wasn't more consistently employed, uh, those students would immediately be sent home from school. So, you know, moving down that path where um, we want to provide some direction on how nurses should be engaged in that decision making. Um, but then we still also have, uh, unlike some other, like the flu, we have specific testing technology still available. So uh, the second part of the guidance is really directed to nurses on how to employ the testing. And, you know, the theme that neither uh, testing, masking, and so forth, um, there should be a focus on keeping kids in school. The testing shouldn't be used as a way to force kids to leave school or to, um, you know, as a requirement for them to re-enter school, uh, certainly when students are tested positive, they they should follow the isolation guidance of the Department of Health. And you know, that's sort of another theme is that uh, these recommendations aren't necessarily school specific per se. Uh, they're specific in that they're intended to be operationalized by school nurses. Uh, but um, we no longer require specific mitigation requirements inside of schools separate from what we require in the general public. So that's that's the summary of it. Um, the other piece sort of in the narrative is that uh, late yesterday, the CDC published uh, its guidance for the fall. Um, so we didn't know the timing on that. So right as of this morning, uh, the health department team is reviewing the CDC's guidance relative to our memo. And so they're there. We'll come forward with some recommendations and we'll work through that, but that's that's not hasn't been very unusual during the 
pandemic, uh, at times we've had to, we always do uh, consider the CDC's recommendations very closely and then interpret that or make sense of that in the Vermont context. So um, that's only the wrinkle right now this week is that uh, as of late yesterday, the CDC has published its guidance. Um, so why don't I pause there if you have any questions. Hopefully you had a chance to look at the memo this morning if you hadn't seen it previously. It's starting to be covered in the media a little bit. Um, Jennifer. So this is really more just a comment, but um, and I, I think the whole masking issue has been politicized in a way that is tremendously unfortunate, I guess. Um, and I'm aware of other cultures in the world where, you know, it is just viewed as good hygiene and good practice and, you know, respectful to your you know peers that if you're sick, regardless of the cause, you know, if you've got a cough or a runny nose that you just put a mask on. And I. I guess I wish and I would encourage schools um, you know, throughout the state to just say, like, listen, if you've got a cough, you just need to wear a mask um, and remove the stigma from doing that. Um, because I think that would go a long way to keeping everyone healthier, you know, whether it's from COVID or the flu or whatever. Um, I mean, that just we, we encourage hand washing. Um, and I think, you know, <laughs> this could just be rolled in as something else that we can do to sort of keep our community safe. Yeah, I don't, I don't add to that comment, but um, yeah, I think, you know, we've done pretty well in that regard, but, you know, to your point, it's, uh, it's been politicized, um, you know, and we, we see that being politicized in Vermont as well. But we also, in our our memo to school nurses, uh, masking is not emphasized. It's it's very much uh, at this point where we have both, um, you know, fairly high vaccination uh, rate in the state, and also the treatments that are available uh, really point to um, the risks associated with the virus being far less than they were two years ago. So. Um, you know, they're, they're, the counterpoint to that is there are moments in the learning environment where masks can, can cause more either social or instructional interference. And, you know, we'll still leave that up to the individuals to a certain extent and to what, it, you know, to your point, you know, maybe it's an education campaign, you know. Yeah, and I guess, you know, long COVID, I think, is still a concern. Um, sure. you know, I keep reading <laughs> reports about that. And I think the other thing, too, that was really instructive for me is that when masks were mandatory, flu rates plummeted. So I, I think there is real benefit to just, you know, not having a blanket mask mandate, but just sort of like, hey, you know, please come to school. But if you're coughing, wear a mask. Um, so anyway, I just throw that out there as like an aspirational yeah. um, guideline because I, I think it would be um, yeah, great. Yeah, <laughs> Oliver, as chair, is probably anxious to jump in here and clarify the board doesn't have a responsibility for these things. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it is what it is. But it, I think, you know, the, the guidance, uh, the memo that we put out is consistent with what pretty much every state's doing right now, certainly what other New England states are doing. Um, I was at um, principals conference this past week, you know, talking with them formally and informally. Uh, I've met with several superintendents in the last couple of weeks. Um, the temperature in the education community and in our schools is let's move forward with education. Um, you know, people are feeling much better about opening school this year. Last year was in particularly very challenging. We had, you know, in our modeling that we were starting to see uh, for the virus early in August, it was pointing to Delta variant peaking like third week of September. Uh, the modeling right now is basically saying BA5 is at its peak and we're on sort of the downward side of that. We'll, we'll no doubt have other variants, but, you know, again, the risk from the virus uh, continued to diminish. Uh, so we're approaching the opening of school year in a much more positive uh, and hopeful disposition than we were previously. Thanks. Okay. Wonderful. Um, other, uh, Tom. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dan, how about other aspects of, um, of school opening regarding um, health and safety? Uh, I know the, um, the masking testing, um, COVID part is um, is very important, but how about um, because I just know around here we're we're do opening school with a major community wide discussion about uh, mental health and anxiety, 
Um, another community-wide discussion around um, uh, active shooter training, um, another, um, and then there are other conversations around vaccination and, and things like that. Um, are you are you providing guidance to schools around any of those, or is there? Um, well, I guess what yeah what what are you seeing as schools start to open in those areas? Yeah, the mental health issues are a focus of our uh, recovery efforts. Uh, so we have that's like a discrete planning uh, track and activity and resources are being allocated towards that. Certainly, school safety uh, has a separate planning. Uh, approach. There will be a statewide school safety conference in November, uh, but we're working directly with districts on their planning. Also uh, doing another round of threat assessment, which is where we've been doing a lot of the training in the last year. Uh, this will be a topic for school district quality standards. You know, um, do we put greater emphasis on requiring, for example, uh, threat assessment teams to be present in each, each district? We have a lot of participation in those activities when we offer them. Uh, but we have no requirement that they do that. Um, we're also interested in unpacking the quality of the, the safety planning that's going on. You know, we uh, require that uh, to a certain extent, um, but we haven't circled back around to sort of evaluate and help people improve uh, those processes as they evolve. Because uh, those those planning uh, approaches are really dependent on the local resources that each school has in its ecosystem. and. It's you can't really pick up a template from like Chittenden County and apply it in Orange County, that kind of thing. We have to sort of evaluate it in an ecosystem by ecosystem basis. So those things are very much a priority um, and the, the planning's well underway in those areas. Uh, we will be, um, you know, the workforce issues, particularly, um, you know, they're, they're also a discrete area of uh, planning and our recovery. So um, at some point I could talk to the board uh, a bit about our recovery efforts, uh, which which have a discrete set of activities and uh, planning initiatives. Thank you. Um, Kim. Thank you. I'm just wondering, um, in thinking about the earlier public comments, what are the the ways to be able to navigate creating safe learning environments for students who are immunocompromised? How yeah. how what are the range of either guidance on that or ways that schools are finding to be able to do that for all students? Yeah, uh, similar. I mean, Ms. LaRose referenced the U.S. Secretary's letter. Um, the, the regulatory mechanisms that we have to deal with students uh, who have those concerns existed pre-COVID, and they're ones we leverage now. And this is Section 504, and in the case of students with uh, disabilities under uh, special education law. So those concerns are addressed largely through uh, those processes. I did share... Um, Ms. LaRose's uh, written comments with my team this morning, so we're going to we're going to unpack those and, um, and and seek to address them. Uh, but that's the patterns I've noticed are been districts really working through 504, uh, which requires reasonable accommodations for students um, who have uh, conditions that might impact their ability to access learning. And then similarly under the IEP process for students who are qualified for special education. Okay. Thank um, you. Patrick. Thank you. And um, Tom hinted at this, but uh, I am saying because of the climate in our nation and indeed in our state, the safety of uh, teachers and students should be at the forefront and uh, planning should have been taking place already and uh, implemented at the start of the school year, not after the school year has started. And so this needs um, proactive response to, um, to the safety of teachers, staff, we shouldn't forget staff and students. And uh, so there should be a plan, a strategic plan to address school safety in each district, in each school. And um, I don't think that's taken very seriously. And something I, for I, Secretary. Yeah, 
I would disagree. I think um, if you're not familiar, I mean, I didn't mean to imply that the planning hasn't happened. We have a well-established program and that might be a great presentation for the board to get educated on before we conclude the processes and supports aren't there. I mean, Vermont's a, a leader in this space. We have something called the Vermont School Safety Center. Uh, and we could we could have our folks, Rob Evans, who who leads that, do that presentation. That's a collaborative between the Agency of Education and the, the Vermont Department of Public Safety. And uh, maybe that would be a great presentation for the board to hear. It's ongoing work. That's the point. It's never it's never over. Um, we have always have a lot of work to do in this space. Thanks for the clarification, Secretary French. Thank you. Yeah, that actually probably would be a good uh, presentation for a future meeting. Um, so I think um, that was uh, uh, Secretary French and you answered the question I had, um, I think, and that is um, we did receive some pretty extensive uh, comment this morning um, and have that in writing. So it sounds like you're you're going to um, look into that and um, if you wouldn't mind sharing um, any uh, response to that, that would be appreciated. Sure, and if the board uh, would like to, you know, schedule testimony on those topics, we could, you know, prepare presentations. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why don't we? If you, we'll give you some time to to digest that, and and then we can think about um, next steps from there. Um, I did want to uh, just to point out um, because I think there was a, a request for the board to direct. Um, the agency, and I just want to be, I think everyone on this board knows, uh, but for benefit of the public, um, the agency does not report uh, to the board. The board is an independent authority, and, and we actually do not have um, legal authority to direct um, the work of, of the agency or the secretary. Um, we can certainly make inquiries um, and, and and love to hear updates, um, but we we have to just be careful to um, respect the um, roles and responsibilities and not exceed our authority. So, um, Patrick, I see your hand is still up. I assume that you meant to take that down. Yeah. Any other um, comments or questions for the secretary on this topic? OK. Um, so that brings us to um, Item J, a pupil waiting update. Um, so, um, Secretary French, if you or someone else from the agency wish to address that. Yeah, I was going to do it. Um, I wanted to welcome Amara, uh, specifically as I engage in the discussion of this topic. Um, Amara, sometimes the issues we get into are complex. This one is probably the most complex one, so I apologize if this gets pretty complex pretty quickly. Um, but this, um, and this is Act 27, 127. I provided the legislative sort of outline of the law. I thought this would be the easiest way to get at this topic. Um, I know my impression as we, we discussed about putting this on the agenda was the board at one point in time, probably in May, was looking for more or less a legislative update as how this was playing out. Of course, this was ultimately signed into law, so I thought it would be useful uh, to look at the law itself as a way to get into the conversation. There, there's some items on this list that probably are of less interest than others. I'm suspecting, but uh, again, like district quality standards emerges here, so you might might want to ask some questions about that. And I certainly uh, was hoping, uh, again, sort of a I'm directing my thinking of, around Amara's uh, introduction to education finance in her first meeting. Um, I was hoping that uh, Dr. Colby would be with us today. Um, Tammy was, as you many of you know, the lead researcher on uh, the pupil waiting report um, and certainly has a fluency, uh, technical fluency and competence on this that um, I don't have. <laughs> but that being said, I'll uh, plow into this. And I was thinking, um, you know, if you saw the outline, the first part of this is really about the weights, which I think is probably, I'm guessing, your primary area of interest. So I'll, I'll um, go through those first and uh, some of the related topics. And then I think I'll pause uh, for conversation and I can talk more about, and a section of the law talks about positions coming to the agency. So a lot of that is directly related to the weights, but I don't know to what extent you're interested in that topic. And we touched on 
uh, briefly already the idea of district quality standards. But um, I think you're all familiar, you know, with this this topic. Um, this is actually a, a project uh, and policy that was initiated as a result of 173 special ed reform. So, and Dr. Colby was involved in that as well. It was a researcher. UVM had a big role in the research behind uh, Act 173, Act 173 special ed reform. A focus of that is finance, special ed finance, and the idea. Uh, should we move uh, from a what had been a reimbursement model in special education to a block grant? And the concern around doing that, or one of the concerns, was if if we give districts instead of just reimbursing districts at a certain percentage for their special ed costs, what are the implications if when we give them a fixed amount of dollars? You know what happens? And um, one of the concerns that was flagged in that was well. Maybe we should be looking at the pupil weights in the broader funding system and if to what extent those were functioning properly, in particular the relationship between special education numbers and poverty. So the hypothesis was put forward that if the poverty weight in particular was functioning well, then perhaps that would be sufficient in terms of allocating state resources. Um, you know, because we're talking about how to divide state resources up in an equitable way. Special ed funding, like the regular ed funding, comes out of the ed fund. It doesn't come from a separate checkbook, so to speak. So we're talking about state resources and how to sh how to make sure they're equitably employed. Um, so through 170, you know, 173 was settled. That was the block grant. The board has a lot of fluency in that and the related regu regulations. And then the legislature uh, commissioned this analysis of the pupil weights. And that report came back, I think, right when the pandemic started. Uh, or right before it really kicked in. So they weren't able to do much on this during the first part of the pandemic. Uh, but basically the report, again, that Dr. Colby was the lead researcher on along with some national experts in the space, basically concluded um, that the current pupil weighting system, uh, firstly, there was no um, basis for its development that is based on any kind of empirical evaluation. So where did the numbers come from? No one could understand they were, there was no empirical analysis in the, back in 1997 when Act 60 was created. Uh, the weights were basically invented. And so um, what they did in this analysis was to look at what are the cost factors, you know, just set aside the idea of weights for a minute. What are the cost factors that contribute to students achieving proficiency on state level assessment? So um for students who you know and they, and they look for the the key ones you know like what what are the key variables if we were to allocate costs based on achieving proficiency what are those big ones and things like poverty um you know different grade levels of students and so forth and the idea i'm thinking again of uh, targeting my remark to amira i'm going to use a metaphor i use with school boards sometime to describe uh, equalized pupils i think of it often as a pizza so if you have a, a 20 inch pizza, I don't know if that's a real dimension of a pizza or not. And your task is to divide up the slices of the pizza in an equitable way. Um, and you can't make the pizza any bigger. So if you think of the circumference of the pizza, pizza representing the number of students in the state, what we're trying to do is make sure the slices are proportional. Um, so a lot of this weighting idea is, well, if, if it does cost more to educate a student in poverty, we want to make sure that the districts that have more of those students receive a bigger slice of the pizza, you know, so to speak. But you can't you can't make the pizza any bigger. It's just about what are the slices, the size of the slices relative to the other slices. So, you know, so it's all about proportionality. So, you know, basically the conclusion previously, uh, as I mentioned, was that uh, the proportionality had no basis for empirical um, analysis so that it, through this cost factor analysis we came up with new weights that's what the report concluded so then the general assembly had to work on this very uh, contentious political issue so it formed a task force to do that um, i know many of you probably appeared before that task force and um, testified and uh, ultimately that led to a legislative proposal that was as i mentioned enacted now in act 127. so uh, that's sort of long-winded introduction to get into the nitty-gritty of it. Um, this this begins to go into effect in fiscal year 25. So there are significant revisions to the weights being contemplated in the law, have been enacted into law. 
And there's basically a transition period between fiscal year 25 and fiscal year 29. So it's going to be phased in. But um, before I talk about the transitory or transition effects of this, um, there is significant adjustments in the weights. There's new adjustment in poverty, for example. There's a new weight for sparsity uh, or the rural nature of schools, and that is a function also of their size. So the intersection between being rural and being small is sort of brought together in terms of a weight. So anyway, we have this new, new, new weighting system that has significant implications for tax rates, meaning there are going to be districts that are going to see significant increases in their taxes because of uh, the weighting, and there's going to be districts that see uh, a lowering of their tax rates. So then the question becomes how to transition to that over time, and the General Assembly entertained several different ways to do that. What they settled on was a very similar mechanism that was employed with Act 46, which is sort of like this capping mechanism. So during this transition period from fiscal year 25 to 29, uh, a school district can't see its tax rate go up more than 5% essentially. So, and that that continues to work, assuming that the prior year, the tax rate was capped as well. So basically uh, making sure that um, the impact on taxes is attributed to this change in weights and not do some other reason. So there's some mechanisms by which that's anal analyzed and so forth. Um, so I think you might be interested in the transition aspects of this. I think a, a key point I'd highlight uh, relative to the poverty indicator is that that has been modified significantly. So um, previously, uh, essentially, the Agency of Education received a poverty, poverty measure from the Agency of Human Services. Uh, that's gone away, and, and that definition, uh, to a certain extent now, has been focused on this issue of free and reduced lunch rates. Um, we've used the, the free and reduced lunch ratio uh, rates as a proxy for poverty. That's very common throughout education. Um, touches many of our programs. Uh, in Vermont, we're going to move away from that in, in favor of a, um, a, a sort of using a poverty indicator that's based on a universal income declaration form. So we're creating a new process inside the Agency of Education to uh, develop a universal income declaration form and process and a review process for that. And it's the data that comes from that uh, income declaration that will be factored into the poverty level uh, calculation. So instead of pulling poverty data from U.S. Census that was filtered through a Agency of Human Services, now we're going to be asking parents to fill out a universal poverty or income declaration form, which will be used to directly uh, indicate, uh, be factored into a indicating a poverty level, which will be used to as a basis for developing a pupil weight for socioeconomic need. Um, I think I could keep going on some of the detail here. Why don't I pause? I'm not sure what your questions might be in some of this. I, 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 and I apologize. I was tied up in other things and, and didn't have the opportunity to follow this one as closely as I would have liked to have. But you know, I, on one hand, I'm glad that we're moving away from free and reduced lunch as a measure because I think it's it's just. I've done some analysis and there's just there's a lot of inaccuracy in that data. Um, and I don't think it's a fair reflection of what's happening on the ground. But I'm curious why um, we didn't look at using the, the census or IRS or tax department data, uh, you know, which is very, very accurate in, in terms of, um, you know, median income within a, you know, within a particular community. Um, why we weren't able to use that and, and, and moving towards this universal income declaration, which has a whole lot of other challenges associated with it. Yeah, and there, you know, this is a national problem. I should say that other states are trying to work on and there hasn't been easy solutions uh, in any case. I think that, you know, when you start saying using tax information, that red, raises a lot of flags in terms of privacy. Um, so that's that's been a challenge, you know, to work on sort of the legal no, no, sharing. No, not individually, but the, the the there's really good statistical data at, at that goes down to the town level. It actually tells you like what the median, you know, income is on a town by town basis. So that's yeah. So I that think. that yeah, and we get that. I mean, that kind of information is 
more represented in the census information and there's community census information you know the 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 larger body of the census statistics is like 10 years you know it's a 10 year period so it's a little stale um the community uh information is is fresher but still a bit stale as well and i don't think um and I, i'm i'm just sort of paraphrasing i think with the committee's deliberations on this i didn't think I, I don't think they thought it to be precise enough or current enough to be used in this circumstance. The other the other challenge, I think, in terms of process, as I observed, there was um, I don't think we fully had con we didn't have full confidence that we understood where those numbers were coming from and how they were brought over to impact weights. So I think there was a general uh, inclination to make sure there was like a direct direct statistic being generated that was being fed directly into that calculation as opposed to being interpreted and filtered through other federal data sources and so forth. Jennifer. Thanks. Um, also on the universal income declaration form, and I don't know if this is you know still very much a work in progress, but how is that going to be distributed? Is it going to all Vermont residents or is it just going to parents of um, you know, school-aged children? Is it a certification form or is there like actual data that you will be requesting? You know, if you could speak to that. Yeah, it's a it's a process that's in flight. So this is a, a piece of work that we're engaged in developing. We um, are required to you know build a stakeholder group around this. Um, so we'll be reaching out to various stakeholder groups to help us both design the form and the process for doing this. But my understanding is this this is a form that will be utilized in school. So it doesn't go to the broader population. We're really trying to ascertain what is the student poverty level. Um, so it's really focused on the school population. But again, that process needs to be designed. So uh, that's just sort of my initial impression of it. It, it could go elsewhere uh, as we get into the design process. It doesn't kick in until next year. So we basically have this year to develop this process in the form. And is it a certification of, you know, my income is between this bracket and this bracket, or like, are you actually requesting certain information? Yeah, again, that's that's going to be determined as we get into the design of the form itself. Um, I think it would be premature to say this is what it's going to be and what it won't be. I think the law, I mean, I could point you to the law. Um, I don't think it provides that level of specificity yet. Um, but, you know, again, there's a basically the takeaway would be there's a, a year long uh, process for the agency to engage with stakeholders to develop both the form and a process related to implementing the form. Thanks. I, I would imagine this uh, this form could um, be received uh, in interesting ways, particularly in smaller communities. Um, so I, <clears throat> I I imagine that it's going to be an interesting process to develop this and, and roll it out. <laughs> um, Tom. Yes, thank you. Dan, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the agency's role in um, the evaluation of the act in achieving its goals and um, in reviewing uh, CTE funding and governance structures. Yeah, uh, well, there's a lot there, Tom. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, just to provide some context, as 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 I mentioned with the district quality standards, there was an attention uh, right up front to sort of like, well, how will we know this is working? You know, we're going to, as the, the General Assembly moved forward in its deliberations, I think this was always a, very much a concern. And part of the, um, the conversation was about uh there were, you know, what is the role of the Joint Fiscal Office in doing that? And a general inclination, uh, the general observation that there should be more eyes on uh, this, the education finance uh, process, you know, that there's been key individuals, both at the agency and in the joint fiscal office of the legislature who sort of have managed this over the years. Uh, some of those folks are retiring. Um, and I think both the General Assembly and I, I agreed that uh, we would all benefit by having better oversight of this. And um, certainly another element that was raised as a result of the study is like, you know, maybe we should do this more frequently than once every 40 years or, or what have you. So um, there are some elements of the law that require uh, 
analysis of the weights on a more frequent basis, and uh, that's part of uh, the positions, the rationale for a couple of the positions that were given to the agency to have give us additional capacity uh, to do that. Um, also, uh, requirements that we work closely with other entities like Joint Fiscal Office, um, uh, geographic information that has to be brought over on the sparsity indicator resides in a different agency. So there's those kind of mechanisms, I would say, firstly, just an oversight of the weights and their review in a periodic basis. Uh, the CT funding uh, piece has been assigned to the Joint Fiscal Office, so that's not something the agency has direct responsibility over. Um, we uh, work closely with um, a couple of the CT centers who had a governance, uh, piloted a governance study, and they they used some of that money to commission analysis of CT funding, and they had hired uh, several prominent uh, education finance experts in the state, namely Bill Talbot, who was a former, some of you might know, former CFO at the agency. They created a couple models that that work was introduced uh, as a report to the General Assembly, and the result was to charge a JFO to go out to bid, and they just posted the RFP the other day uh, to go out to bid for analysis of CT funding. I'm sure it'll be built off a lot of that work that Bill Talbot had explored in that earlier report, but the agency doesn't have oversight of that. We're a partner in it. We'll be providing technical support to that process, but essentially JFO has the responsibility and their responsibility is to contract it out. What, there was a third piece I think you asked me about. Uh, no, th those were the, those were, there are two. Um, just a follow-up um, in, Will the JFO also be the one taking a look at governance structures, um, or is that more in the agency's um, governance of CTE? Yeah. No, I don't think that's. I think JFO has been uh, tasked exclusively to look at uh, the finance piece. Okay. Uh, I don't think there's anything in 127 on CTE governance per se. It, well, that's what it's, it, uh, it says. Requires the JFO to contract for services to review CTE funding and governance structures, and that second part was what I was interested in. Yeah, I think if I read that section, um, I think it's really through the lens of the finance, you know, if there is something that emerges relative to governance, but the focus is on uh, the CT funding system itself, I believe is how I would phrase it. Yeah. Funding and governance, yeah, I'm looking at it. Uh, yeah, it's a complete systematic examination of existing funding structures and how these structures impede or promote the state's educational workforce needs. Examine the governance structures in relationship to those funding structures. So it's really about, you know, the funding and to what extent governance uh, functions under that funding. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Patrick. Thank you. Um, Secretary French, as the form is being developed, and I'm sure this will be taken into consideration, but I want to say it anyway, that uh, we should, you should be sure to make it accessible to our increasingly diverse communities. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, you know, again, I, I should point out this, um, this process is also related sort of tangentially to another policy initiative, which is universal school meals. Mm. Uh, but in Act 127, it does lay out um, a process for the agency, a requirement for the agency to engage with stakeholder groups in the development of this. So absolutely accessibility will be an important consideration. Other um, questions or comments? Board members? No? Wonderful. Uh, well, thank you for that. So, oh, um, Secretary French. Uh, Patrick, is did you just put your hand back up or? Nope. Okay, took it down. Um, okay, so that I think concludes um, item J. Uh, so we are ahead of schedule. Um, I thought what we might do is just check in on item M, which is our um September meeting um and and really that's to say that um and, and we can come back to this again but we'll we'll touch on this before and then we'll go to to break and and uh we'll recess until 10:10 10, 10. um but on um the September meeting just a reminder there uh there is a doodle poll out to try to identify the best time uh to meet in September um and after hearing from a number of folks um, the consensus was rather than trying to do like a, a two day retreat, we would just do one full day 
in person. So targeting um, a 9 a.m. start and, and where uh, the plan is to have this in person in, Ad in Addison County. Um, so we're the thinking is that we would um, could use us some time in the morning um, to do uh, a little bit of a tour of the um, of the area. And then um, uh, and then we would uh, convene at a location somewhere in that region uh, for uh, our, our business meeting um, and obviously um, resolving some of the um, uh, governance issues in Addison County um, will, will certainly uh, be a big part of what we're doing, but we'll have a few other agenda items as well. So anyway, we do need uh, to make sure we get all of those responses back so that we can find the, um, uh, and, and secure the best date uh, for that meeting. So um, well, again, we'll we'll pick this up again later on in the meeting, but I just want to put that reminder out there. So I think with that, um, uh, we will stand in recess until 10 10 um, at which time we'll pick up um, item k which is the ripton status report uh, review um, so uh, you will have a little bit more time for a break jennifer sorry well and i'm just wondering um oh no never mind <laughs> never mind yep. um so we'll have a little bit more time for uh, for a break, but I, I do ask that you try to get back actually a little before 1010. So I, I, I want to kick us off right on the dot at at, um, at 1010. So. OK, I th think we have uh, a quorum, so. As soon as Jennifer returns, we'll get started again. There we go. Wonderful already, so. Um, we uh, are coming back uh, to our meeting. Uh, it's 1010. We are now on um, item K, which is uh, to hear from the um, Ripton Status Report Review Committee, um, specifically our um, uh, proposed uh, preparedness uh, statement. So, um, provide a little bit of background, but before I get too far into this, I do uh, want to make sure that we have uh, folks from Ripton with us. So I'm looking for um, Steve Cash. I see Steve Cash and uh, Mark Ottinger is um, legal counsel. Uh, so uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, joining us just to confirm that you guys are here, that would be wonderful. Suzanne, you may need to give them access. Steve, Mark, okay, there you go. Steve, I see you. And Mark Ottinger, are you with us? I am here, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Good morning. Um, good morning. We were hoping to see that that view out your window. Uh, that's <laughs> there. You go. It's a beautiful day in Burlington. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so, um, alrighty. So, a little bit of background uh, for those of us joining us. So, the legislature, under the terms of Act One Seventy Six, um, directed the Ripton School Board. Uh, to uh, prepare a status report. Well, two things. One is it um, it uh, directed the Ripton School Board uh, to make a decision as to whether it wanted to go live uh, with its operations on July 1st of 2023, uh, or it, it provided them the opportunity to defer um, the start date until July 1st of 2024 and that um, law uh, directed them to advise the state board of the date that they were uh, planning to choose and then the law went on to direct uh, the Ripton School District to submit a status report uh, by July uh, in the year preceding the chosen operation date so 
uh, effectively that meant uh, that the Ripton School Board was obligated to submit a status report detailing the actions it had completed and uh, planned to take uh, to operationalize its school district uh, prior to July 1st of 2023, which is the date that the Ripton School Board chose to uh, to go live. Um, Ripton submitted that status report uh, to the board on July 20th uh, of this year. Um, and the law also directed the state board to uh, review the status report uh, to provide an opportunity for the Ripton School Board to be heard and at the board's discretion to uh, to take testimony from uh, the Agency of Education, the ACSD and others. Um, and then further went on to uh, direct the state board to issue um, an opinion as to Ripton's preparedness um, and specifically to identify whether the board saw, uh, uh, felt there was reasonable risk um, to Ripton's readiness by the, the targeted go live date. Um, the board had to provide that uh, report uh, or, or, or statement, if you will, opinion um, under the terms of the law by the end of August. Um, so that didn't give us a whole lot of time to, to complete this work. Um, and one of the reasons for that deadline for the board is that if we issue an, uh, an opinion that indicates Ripton uh, may not be ready, or if there's more specifically, if there is reasonable risk that Ripton will not be prepared to go live. Um, that opens up some unique opportunities uh, for Ripton. Specifically, um, it gives Ripton, if the on motion of the school board or by a petition of the uh, of five percent of the electorate in the town, the ability uh, to hold a vote in the town um, asking if folks want to return back to uh, ACSD. Uh, so that's um, uh, and that vote needs to occur before September 30th of this year. So um, all of this is detailed in the draft um, opinion. So and, and Donna can, can certainly feel free to chime in and keep me honest here if I have have misspoken on any of the details or the dates, uh, but suffice it to say, very compressed uh, time frame. The board um, uh, back in June established a, a committee uh, to undertake this work. Um, that committee uh, uh, included myself, uh, Kim Gleason, Tammy Colby, Jenna O'Farrell, and um, Lyle Jepson. The committee met several times um, following the receipt of uh, well, we actually met initially for an organizational meeting prior to receiving the status report, and then we met several times after uh, receiving and reviewing the status report. Um, we heard from Ripton. Um, we heard from a number of uh, uh, consultants who uh, had been working with Ripton and uh, the state board heard from a number of uh, educational experts in the field who had relevant expertise. Um, and uh, we, as, as, a, as a committee, spent a considerable amount of time reviewing the material submitted, the testimony we heard, prepared uh, a, um, our, our findings and um, uh, our, our opinion, um, put together the draft, and uh, uh, work through that over the past week and have voted unanimously uh, to submit uh, this as our recommended draft to the full board for its consideration. So that's what is before you today. Um, I um, want to you know, thank everybody who participated in this process. It was, uh, again, a very compressed uh, time frame. We uh, received a lot of information, heard from a lot of people. Um, and I want to acknowledge that this uh, is, um, you know, certainly not the result that the Ripton uh, School Board uh, wanted to hear. Um, but my hope is that um, 
this process has really helped everyone, including the state board and uh, the Ripton School Board, understand just how complex our education system is and uh, how complex um, our, our regulatory environment is. Um, and it's, you know, striking out and, and trying to form a, a, a school district from scratch is, is, is no small feat. Um, and, and this report bears that out. So um, with that, I, I'm going to pause um, and it's unfortunate just circumstances, um, some illness and, and some other things. We, we don't have the other uh, three members of the committee with us today. So, uh, so Kim and I um, will be available to, to answer questions, but I, I, I do want to point out that the, the committee was chosen um, very much uh, with a view towards bringing in a, a broad range of diverse experience into the mix. So we had, you know, two former elementary school principals, uh, namely Jenna O'Farrell and, and Lyle Jepson, both with considerable ex um, experience uh, as school administrators in Vermont's public school system. We had Tammy uh, Colby, uh, who's an associate professor of education policy at, at UVM and obviously uh, very involved in education policy uh, in the state as one of the principal authors of the, the, the waiting study that we just heard about. Kim Gleason as a longtime school board member and, and former school board chair. Um, we're all members um, of this committee and, um, and, and myself as a former legislator who spent a significant amount of time um, in uh, education finance uh, policy in the legislature. Um, we individually brought um, you know, our own expertise but then we supplemented that with uh, the experts uh, that we heard from uh, in the field and, and are very grateful for uh, the time that they they put into this effort. So Kim, um, did I miss anything? Do you want to add anything? I think you got it, Oliver, and I'm really grateful for this uh, support and expertise that came to um, our conversations to help inform our decision making. Yep. So I um, I won't go through the the report um, in in detail. Uh, I, th I think everybody's had a, a ch the chance to review it. But um, in summary, after uh, reviewing all of the information and hearing from everyone. Um, the committee came to the conclusion that there is is not merely uh, a reasonable risk of unpreparedness for July uh, to go live next year, but there is in fact uh, a significant risk um, and uh, the committee is is very concerned about um, the impact that this would have on students if this were to move forward. Um, so I will um, at this time I, I do want to provide Ripton uh, with an opportunity to address the board. So um, so Steve or, or Mark, I don't know which of you would like to um, go first. Steve, with your permission, perhaps I can give a quick uh, update. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Thank you. Let me start, please. So my name is Mark Ottinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm an attorney in Burlington and I represent the Ripton School District. Um, I was consulted on this issue um, some time ago, but uh, was then away from the issue for a while. Uh, I've become immersed, re-immersed over the past week or so. And I think the most productive thing for me to start with is to tell you where we are in terms of the thinking of the Ripton School District Board. Um, we are right now at a stage of having reached out to the uh, Addison Central School District Legal Council. Um, and we're waiting to hear back. I only spoke with that office, I think, yesterday um, about the possibility of a return to ACSD, um, probably conditioned upon the idea that there would be a charter change, if you will, and that that charter change relates to, um, let's call it um, a vote that would be required at, in the event that any dis, any school within the SD, the ACSD, were to be closed. Um, this would be a electoral vote that would be available to um, 
any former legacy town school district within ACST, not just Ripton, um, but on the condition, if, if in fact ACST is willing to do that, I am cautiously optimistic that we could um, engineer a return to ACSD on that condition. As I said, I, we've reached out to them that we have not yet heard back, but I'm available today or tomorrow to keep to take up that conversation because as the chairman indicated, this timeline is tight. Um, there is the possibility of what some people have described as the off-ramp, the option that um, the chairman was describing that must be triggered, if at all, on or before September 30th, um, whereby either the uh, Ripton School District Board chooses to warn the question of a return to ACSD um, or that consideration could essentially be forcibly put on the agenda for an, for an electorate vote by a petition of 5%. Um, if, in fact, either of those methods of triggering an electorate vote on the issue were to take place, and if the electorate were to vote to return, essentially the problem is solved. So there's two potential ways in which this problem goes away so far that we've talked about. The first being uh, ACSD agreeing to the, um, the school closure requirement, uh, electoral vote requirement, or the vote of the electorate in Ripton to simply return and abandon their earlier decision to leave. Um, if neither of those eventualities comes to pass, then my reading of the law is we have to go right back to 16 VSA 261, um, wherein the state board has to either declare um, a school district an SD under the criteria that are set forward, set forth in that statute in terms of you know size and in terms of uh, readiness, um, or if the district is not susceptible to being named an SD, then it has to be assigned to another SU. Um, this is longstanding traditional sort of education governance structure across the state of Vermont. As I recall it, and I know there's been a lot of new legislation, but I'm not aware of any change to 261 um, that would cause me to conclude that the analysis so far is incorrect. I'm happy to be corrected. Um, the fact that the state board appears to be about to conclude that Ripton is not ready to become an SD is, I would say, not terribly surprising. I mean, it's got, I think, 81 kids, you know, a combination of elementary kids that are actually served uh, in existing grades at its elementary school and then kids, high school age kids that are tuitioned out. Um, you know, the, the law reflects an optimal or minimal minimum uh, district size, I think, of, of 900 in other contexts. So it's not surprising that a group of individual students uh, of less than 10% of that would not um, be able to you know, do the necessary infrastructure that would be necessary to administer, self-administer an SD. Um, in fact, if we look at 261C, I think that that option essentially would be ruled out um, if the board votes, as it appears that it will, that Ripon's not ready. Um, I don't know that it would be profitable for us to talk about, you know, if if an SD is indeed not an option, uh, about where um, the state board might choose to place Ripton, which SD or SU rather that it would propose to attach it to. Obviously, it has long historical roots with ACSD. Um, that would make a lot of sense. I understand that it would add a layer of administration that previous consolidation essentially had eliminated. And in that respect, it could be perceived as a step backward in that respect. Um, you know, adding an additional board um, and all the sort of efforts that that entails. Um, I know that there are also some variables out there that are make it even harder to predict, such as Lincoln. Um, I have not yet been able to find the outcome of the Starksboro vote, uh, but Starksboro may also present a similar issue, both uh, administratively um, and also geographically in that area. Um, I would also, in, in concluding, I would basically point out that the State Board has huge discretion in 16 VSA 261D, um, because if, if you are in a situation where you choose, let's say, to overlay an SU, uh, at a ACSD, uh, it can be done in ways that are 
as efficient as possible, consistent with the need for um, optimizing the educational experience that the kids receive. So I think that this problem is 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 not uh, at all difficult to solve. I think that it may be premature for us to speculate too much more deeply about where which SU might receive Ripton in the event that all these other things don't come to pass. But to sort of come full circle and to conclude, I would say that my next step is to talk to the ACSD's uh, council and see if they're amenable to the idea of reintegration with the charter change. I'll stop there. Excellent. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Ottinger. I just two um, two things I just want to point out. One is that RIP, the, the, there's not a question on the table uh, about Ripton being assigned to an SU, that decision was already made in, in January. So Ripton is, in fact, a, an SD. So that's one point I just want to clarify. The other point of clarification is that the draft opinion we've authored um, is not specific to the question of Ripton's preparedness as an SD. It speaks to Ripton's preparedness in any configuration as and as D, as a member of the proposed supervisory union uh, and as a member of any other SU, just as a school district taking all the SU considerations away, our finding was that Ripton is not going to be prepared um, with uh, to assume those responsibilities. So just two points of clarification. And if I uh, may just say this yes. uh, very, very briefly. Um, there's an inherent inconsistency that I hear between the notion of you are an SD and on the one hand, and that the board is then concluding that you're un incapable of being an SD. So it strikes me that I know you, you're not going to eventually put into effect a solution that is unsuccessful. It's just my opinion based on the law that if you conclude that the SD is not a good format, I understand that they are currently denominated in SD, but if it's not a viable format and the kids need to be served, which they do, that alternative, the alternative that I see is returning to a 261 analysis. So I appreciate the opportunity for that follow-up. No, no, fine. Um, just want to point out that our, our, our opinion is that they're not poised, they're, they're not set up for success in any configuration. Thank you. Um, Understood. Uh, Kim. I think on that point, importantly, when this request came before the State Board of Ed, our tools were quite limited by what was available in the law. And our only question, we really, we asked more questions. We invited the process to take more time and, and consideration. But our only tools, having been presented with the affirmative votes from the communities, were to say, will these students have a place to go to school that will meet ed quality standards? The new law presents much greater um, requirements with respect to analysis and before it can even go to a vote. So I think given the tools that we had at the time um, and that which was available within our authority, we um, recognized the challenges and still had to vote within the law to approve their withdrawal. And then at that point, took in much testimony to understand the impact to the area SDs and SUs and recognize that there was not a solution. And if they were to go on their own you know, they had responsibilities in doing so. And and that's, I think, if I'm mischaracterizing, I think we are, that was how we came to the decisions we did. Um, a, a, another, on a separate matter, and certainly if I got any of that wrong, Donna, Dan, Oliver, uh, correct me. I think any or anybody from our, our board who might have remembered it differently. Um, but the other question I have, Mr. Ottinger, is um, I am wanting to better understand you are reaching out to ACSD's legal counsel to consider, ask them if they will consider a charter change. I'm not, I'm not understanding exactly how that interacts with their current status and what that would mean. It strikes me that they would still need to exercise 
the off-ramp vote, right? To even, like, I'm not, I think they only, I don't think the, um, I don't think I'm recalling that the vote is conditioned on anything, right? Having to do with whether or not ACSD would execute a charter change. That seems like a separate matter. And the timeline for their options that are available to them right now are rather quick. I'm pretty sure the entire ACSD would need to vote to make a charter change. Well, that's an interesting question that I have I have sort of tangentially been exposed to on, on several occasions in the past. I've never faced it squarely. The question of charter changes and who can make them. Is it, it does the board of the of the SD have the ability to unilaterally make a, a charter change or does it require an electorate across the SD vote? I think the answer to that is it depends. It depends on what is being voted on and it also probably depends on the specifics of the charter in question. Um, the charter in question here would be the um, the ACSD uh, charter. My understanding is that they were approached previously on another issue and were informed by their council. At the time, it was a different individual, but I saw a letter saying that uh, that I believe that I would construe as saying that it was his opinion that the ACSD board has the ability to agree to that type of charter change. Um, and I see, I looked at it briefly, the, the articles again briefly, and I see nothing in there that would contradict that. So my understanding is that if the ACSD board were to decide that giving this veto power on elementary school closure was an acceptable solution to this entire thing and preferable to potentially having an SU with a two district system, my understanding is that the ACSD board could um, take that action without putting it to an electorate wide vote. Now, you, you also raised the question about the relationship between that and the September 30th vote. Um, I think that the two are related, but not sort of contingent upon each other. And I think that it would certainly help the folks in Ripton if they're going to vote on returning to ACSD, if they can better understand what that looks like, because it could look as in the in the changed environment with the veto power, if you will, with a veto vote or it could be simply the ACSD that they left, which obviously they chose to leave. And so that would be certainly less desirable, but a, a better informed electorate, it seems to me, um, is always gonna give rise to a better outcome in an election. I wonder too, though, on that point, again, timing, and and I, I don't have an answer, maybe Donna or Dan may know about um, the mechanics of charter change. I think, um, I think to suggest that um, more knowledge hasn't come to this process by virtue of this, the report that Ripton provided, the report we're providing, um, illuminates the requirements of running an SD in a way that seemed not to have been um, an awareness on the first round of votes. So that, that I think is just, so factually there's more information regardless. I, um, I think the timeline is tight regardless. So I, I guess I'm still focusing on the options that we know to be available in law and um, I guess I'll, I'll pause. There are others I'm sure with questions and I'm yep. sure I'll have more, thanks. As I said, if I may just interject, I'm I'm yes. relatively late to this consideration. I apologize for that, but I've tried to get up to speed as quickly as possible, tried to acquaint myself with sort of where we are now and, and what are the options going forward. I have an open mind. I think that Ripton Town School District Board has a very open mind. Um, the situation we're in, I, everybody feels uncomfortable with the idea of them going forward as an SD in July 1st, 2023. Um, I just don't know that we we know all, we know many of the questions uh, and we're working on the answers and the timeline is indeed short. I will absolutely stop at this point. So just uh, I'll turn to Jennifer in it here in a second, but just an observation on the on the timing, right? It takes uh, you have to warn a vote 30 days prior. So I, I could foresee um, and that vote has to occur, before, I believe, before September 30th. So essentially the vote needs to be warned sometime between now and, and uh, 
the end of this month, the end of August. So, so really just a few weeks remaining. Um, so what could potentially happen is the vote could be warned. So at least the warning requirements are met for the vote to occur at some point later in September, but before that September 30th deadline. And during that window, there's there's time for ACSD to consider the proposed changes to the articles of agreement. So in effect, what I'm suggesting here is that it may be unrealistic to expect any sort of sig positive or negative signal on the, the proposal to change the articles of agreement between now and the end of this month when the warning deadline is. But if folks understand the sequencing here, you could warn the meeting, have it at least legally warned concurrently after or during that warning period, hopefully resolve these issues with the ACSD prior to the actual election date. Does that make sense, Mr. Ottinger? I completely sort of agree with you. I absolutely okay. agree with you. Okay, uh, Jennifer. Thanks. Um, so, Mr. Andrew, I'm just trying to understand the conversations that you are having with ACSD. That really goes to the first option of the Ripton School Board to decide to recommend taking the off ramp, but doesn't really speak to the remaining option available to the you know voters if they get five percent of the you know signatures to you know put something on um, to be warned for a vote. Am I understanding that correctly? I'm I'm not sure. Um, my understanding is that the vote that has to take place before September 30th, which I agree needs to be uh, warned at least 30 days in advance, would be on the question of shall we return sort of carte blanche back to ACSD, just same as it ever was. Um, that vote can be triggered either by the board or by a 5% petition. Um, what I'm suggesting is that yes, and I think what the chair is also suggesting is that if we were to warn that vote on, I don't know what kind of a day of the week it is, but uh, September 29th, um, and in the meantime, work with ACSD to try and see whether the charter change would be an option. Um, either way, we would be having a vote. Um, well, we would be having a vote on September 29th unless it weren't necessary, but I think it would be necessary if there was a alternative solution that had been negotiated between ACSD and Ripton, you know, specifically to to add and somewhere in paragraph 14 in their articles, if you have those in mind, uh, is where I think the language would go. And it would literally be a sentence, you know, something to the effect that prior to the closure of any school within the boundary of uh, ACSD, uh, the affected town, former town school district will have the ability to conduct a electorate vote um, and will be have the ability to veto the same if the electorate votes a majority of the electorate votes against it's really that's probably even longer than it needs to be but um i'm not sure if that answers your question but these things would be happening simultaneously and my point is that the outcome of the negotiations could easily bear on the outcome of the election the yeah just, I'm, I'm just trying to sort of take this information and, and put it into the framework that was established by the general assembly and i i think you know, the way I'm understanding it is if these negotiations with ACSD are fruitful, then that speaks to the decision of the Ripton School Board to vote to take the off ramp and rejoin ACSD. Um, and if those negotiations are not fruitful, I mean, the, the Ripton School Board could still vote to take the off ramp and rejoin the ACSD or an you know that you could get your five percent of the electorate to put together a petition to warn something to be voted upon but I, I still think you know some some body whether it's the ripton school board or the electorate needs to make that decision to take the off-ramp and whether you know there's new information that's flowing into that decision i i think sure but i think you know in my mind you either need to proceed under, you know, option A or option B, ultimately. Well, but it, maybe uh, maybe I'm if, wrong about if, this, but I think it's the electorate that has to make this decision, not the board. If, if the question by yeah. September yeah. 30th. So, yeah, so let me let me just clarify. So the vote, right, is the same. It's it the vote can be triggered by either the 5% okay. a petition of 5% or the board, but the vote is to to Mark's point is a vote of the electorate. 
And okay. I think I'm sorry. <laughs> yep, no worries. And I think Mark, just just to I think cut through some of the this is correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what I'm hearing you say or signal is that the board intends to call for the vote. So just just to get that warned at, with the idea that it would it would work in good faith to try to negotiate its desired outcome. And theoretically, if it um, gets the desired outcome between now and say hypothetically September 29th, it would tell its voters like, hey, we've got a great deal. We recommend voting for it. If it doesn't, it might say to the voters, hey, we, you know, either we go forward or we don't. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, I think you are reading that correctly. Um, and it certainly would be my recommendation to keep all options open. And I think that the way you do that is to is to schedule the vote. And I think I'm, this is off the top of my head, but it strikes me that if the if the Ripton School District is the one that schedules the vote, as opposed to the 5% petition, because with the 5% petition, it has to go forward. But if the school board schedules the vote and then reaches agreement with ACSD on the uh, charter change, then I think the board, the Ripton School Board could either take the vote off, say it's not necessary, or they could decide to have the vote and say, well, it's actually going to be advisory. Um, and that sort of empowers the electorate still to weigh in as much as possible. That question is, is something that's down the road. Um, um, I'm going to correct you there, Mr. Ottinger, but if once you warn the vote, you can't unwarn it. Okay. Well, that may be. I that don't may believe be true. so. I, and, and that maybe, may be true, but we would warn yeah, it. Yeah. We would warn it and have have okay. it um, just to keep the options okay. open. Because when I entered the fray here and was told that well, the July first deadline for asking for another year has come and gone, um, I was a little bit frustrated by that. And I, my approach would be since there are there's a lot at stake here, and it's complicated. And so I like to keep as many options open as possible. And um, as I said, there's there's many paths to success, but ultimately um, we may be back in 261 if none of them work out. But again, I think it's premature to be concerned about that at this stage. I, I do see Donna's hand up, so I suspect she uh, might be able to keep us all honest here. <laughs> Um, I'm, I, I may have misunderstood a point that was just said, but I just want to make sure that it's very clear. Um, the um, an agreement to chart. Well, first of all, uh, uh, Mark is absolutely right. A charter change depends upon the terms of the, of the articles of agreement themselves. And it also depends upon the statute about how you go about making amendments, which pulls into the consideration how the original articles were warned, the manner in which they were warned. So so that aside, it, you know, whether or not those articles can be changed by the board or by, or they need to be uh, changed by a vote of the, the, the uh, electorate is just something that's just out there. And I'm not, you know, going to try to come in and say that I know which way it is. Um, but this, the second thing to keep in mind is that even if the two, even if even if whoever needs to agree to the charter change agrees to the charter change, that to to, to have this provision about school closure, um, that in and of itself is not going to be enough to have Ripton come back into the fold. Ripton has two ways to come back to ACSD. Either it takes what everyone's calling the off ramp, and there's a vote of Ripton. Um, only Ripton, it doesn't have to be approved by anybody else, only Ripton that it wants to come back. And then under the terms of that off ramp in section four, it alone has the ability to make the decision we want to come back. Or if at some point in the future, you know, any point in the future, two years down the road, um, it could go through the 721 process by which a school district joins an existing union school district. The difference between the 721 process and what's in Section 4 is that in Section 4, it's totally up to the Ripton voters. In 721, it's up to the Ripton voters and it's also up to the ACSD voters. So the ACSD voters under 721 could say, no, we're really tired of this. We don't want you. It's not good for us to have you or, you know, whatever. Or they could say, yes, we're great, great. We want you to come. But that's the distinction between the two. They have a really short amount of time to decide on their own that they want to join. After that, the the ACSD voters also get to weigh in. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, yes. I, I don't. I don't like to sort of 
go third party here. But my question for uh, for Donna would be the following. Um, can't we warn a September 30th vote, the return vote um, under Section 4, um, conditioned upon the the revised um, charter change? And the answer probably is we don't know. You don't know, I don't know, but I don't see any reason, I don't see any harm that would be done to public policy by structuring it that way. That isn't something that I've considered or spoken with my general counsel about, and I don't feel comfortable coming down yeah. in any, in any way on it. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I would say, you know, we'd have to look at the, that, that session law was pretty specific, so we'd have to look at the words in, in the law. I'm not sure. I don't have it in front of me, but my recollection is it, it, it didn't look like it had that level of discretion. I think it was a binary question without sort of conditions attached to it. But anyway, I just, I think the spirit, I think what I'm hearing, I, I just, before we get too far into the weeds here, I think the spirit of what I'm hearing from Ripton through uh, its attorney is, um, is, a, is a desire to find a way to, to return to ACSD. Um, uh, it sounds like there's a, a commitment to doing that. I, I just want to return, I, I, something you said before made me a little nervous. I would hate to see a scenario play out where the school board warns a vote and then say September 5th decides, well, we're not going to have the vote because then you've taken away, you've disenfranchised the 5% of the electorate. So that does, and I don't even think you can do that. I, I'm no, no, not, no. that's probably a, a question for Emily, but I, I think once it's warned, it's warned. I certainly, I, I take your point. I certainly yep. agree that if it was petitioned, you can't unpetition it. Uh, the board right. can't unpetition it, but even, and it would be probably at best bad policy for the board to, to uh, note the vote and then uh, back off. But uh, so I agree with you. And I, I don't know the answer to your question, but I'm willing to accept the fact that that option of, of even if legal, the option of warning it and unwarning it, um, it would be bad policy. Yeah. And I think on the condition, I, I just trying to condition the vote, I, I think creates some additional complexities. I, I, I think the original sort of idea of, Warn the vote, have the discussions in parallel. The voters are going to know before the vote how things are looking, whether they're going to they're they're going to get the desired outcome with a charter change or not. And it's a small enough community. I, I don't think it's. Uh, I mean, Steve, feel free to chime in here, but I, I think it's safe to say folks are going to know before they go and vote. You, you know whether they they feel like they got what they wanted or didn't. So the and they, if if they feel uncomfortable, whether you voted down. Understood. I, I love Steve's input. I, I hate to dominate the conversation. I thought I was going to have about a 5% roll. Um, but yeah, we, we are indeed all working. We're all rowing in the same direction here. How we get there exactly, I think we're, we're trying to predict the chess match many moves ahead. Um, I think that as soon as we find out whether ACSD is willing to work with us on the charter change, that will, uh, either way, that will limit uh, the algorithm quite a bit. Um, yeah, Oliver, if I could jump in at this point. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, one, I, I don't think our school board has any stomach or willingness to warn a vote in our town and then pull back on that warning, even if it was yep. legal. Um, that's not a situation that I think would be successful in our town. Um, so even if our attorney advised, advised us, that was something we could do. Um, I do not think that's something we would do. So it's, that's my first point. Um, as far as kind of this question of returning to ACSD, I think we as a board agree there's interest in returning to ACSD. However, it's one conversation if we are returning carte blanche, as Mark said, to AC, ACSD as it was, and it's another if there's some protections in there. Those are just two different conversations we need to have with our town. Um, so that's part of it. I did kind of as my comments on this whole process, I did want to take a moment and just acknowledge the time and energy the State Board of Ed and the committee has put into this review process. Um, it's been a tight time frame all around. Um, Ripton has certainly put a lot of time and energy into this. 
this outcome um, being deemed unprepared is not one. It's not the one we wanted. Um, but that does not negate the time and energy that has gone into this. And while it has not been comfortable, this has been some amount of a learning process that does have some benefits. Um, so I will say that I do hope as we move out of this phase of the process, as Mark laid out, there's there's a number of ways this could go. And I really hope for as much energy as myself and my fellow board members have devoted to navigating this situation, if you want to call it a problem, um, I hope we can all put that much energy into finding a successful solution. So I hope going forward um, we can do that. And then the last thing um, I would like to say is in Act 176, Section 9 does have a school closure study um, that the AOE is due to provide in September of 2023. And when this legislation was being drafted, Ripton asked to be included as a stakeholder in that study. And I would really appreciate um, getting our opportunity to include our voice in that. I recognize it's a very broad study, but I still think we have a unique perspective that we would love the chance to share in that study. I know that's beyond the SBE and beyond this conversation, but it is tied to it. Um, with that, if the SBE has questions for me, I'm happy to answer. I can tell folks um, our plan at the moment is to hold the informational meeting that is required of us in Act 176 on September 21st. Um, so that is in the works and that's all I have. So if people have questions for me, I'm happy to answer. Great. Um, so Steve, just one final comment, uh, you know, just a thought on the uh, on the vote, uh, you know, uh, if you decide to move forward with warning the vote, um, you know, just a suggestion, I, I, I think having it just be the binary, putting the legal issues aside, even if, if it's legally not a problem, it just handcuffs you, if it, it, you know, because it, then you have to be really precise with the words. And, and as you're having conversations with ACSD, there could be some nuances, you know, in those conversations. And by by trying to condition the vote on something, it, it really makes it difficult for you and ACSD to come to you know, a good, you know, you might go through discussions and come up with a good solution, but it doesn't meet the the condition. So that's why I'm suggesting I, I'd be really wary about trying to condition that vote. Um, I, I think it just locks you into a, a an uncomfortable position that you can't get out of. Um, yeah, I appreciate that, and I, I think to Mark's point about leaving multiple options on the table. Um, you know, I can understand that at the same time, we will work with our legal counsel yep. um, to make sure we are in a good place as far as that warning. Okay, good. Um, Kim. I think this might be a Donna question um, and maybe for information purposes for this this group and what Mark shared. Is it even something that a unified school district can do to warn a vote in only one of the towns within the unified school district? And this is to the solution that you, like you can't close a school without the district warning the vote in the individual town. I, I guess in my thinking it was the school district can warn a vote for its it's all of the towns, but I wasn't sure that I understood it could warn a vote for individual towns within a unified district. Are you specifically asking about the closure the, vote, the process by which something's warned, or the ability to ask only one town to vote for something? So procedurally or substantively? You're asking I substantively. Second question. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a good question. Um, back in, I think it was 2010, when um, this, the legislature first created the incentive programs to encourage districts to um, merge, 
it included a provision that said, and your articles of agreement, and I may be getting the details of this wrong and the timing of this wrong, but this is generally the idea. Um, you may include a provision that for the first four years, um, a, a school closure can only occur if it's voted on by the um, by the town in which the school is located, town voters in which the school is located. Um, that was in general, that was something that if it was incorporated into the articles of agreement in, in all of the ones that were created in Act 46, it was done for a limited period of time. I believe there may have been one or two that had it for all time, and it was something that the agency didn't feel entirely comfortable about, but we didn't feel as though it was, you know, certainly wasn't going to be something that we were going to be bringing a lawsuit about. It was going to have to be something that would have to be challenged. So in answer to your question, I don't know. I think that it's possibly something that could be challenged because it's not something that is in, is contemplated, except in those provisions that provided for um, incentives when it was talked about as being a short period of time. So that's a long way of saying I don't know, but the issue is complicated. Thank you. That that was sort of my wondering, thinking that the municipality that is a unified school district is a composite of many towns and um, questions of school related matters. I know that you can warn for that. I just wasn't sure that you can. So again, thinking about that vote to close, it strikes me that it seems straightforward that yes, you can, you could make that be for all towns to vote, but I'm not sure that I can necessarily see the direct line and I am not an attorney to how a school district would warn for a single binding vote of an electorate in a single town. Um, that's a, a question of mine, but it is not really related to our findings. It is, I think, yep. curiosity for you all to consider. Well, um, just just to close this out, I, uh, 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 Steve, I, I just I do want to acknowledge um, and, and we made a point of acknowledging in in the draft opinion that, you know, Ripton chose this path as uh, as really uh, as a means to, um, you know, protect its elementary school from perceived threat of of closure at some point in the future. And um, what I want you to take away from this and and everyone in Ripton is, while you may not have it gotten what you wanted out of this um, this particular review and your readiness, you you should um, feel good about the the fact that you've elevated these concerns about um, uh, school closure and particularly the closure of small schools and the threat of of closing small schools um, did get a lot of attention in the legislature and resulted in um, in the study that that you referenced as well as the the moratorium on you know small school closures sort of in the meantime you know so this um, your your efforts are uh, are you know were not in vain and and you know I think you should you know feel good about you know that legislative outcome so yeah and i if i could for a sec oliver yep. um yeah i appreciate that and um it has been a tremendous amount of work it's been a very long endeavor um i think what's important for us in ripton and i, I suspect other small schools i don't intend to say that i speak for all small schools in any way um but i think it's important that we do get to a space where there is some protections. And I do recognize um, where we have gotten to, but I also think we it would be good to make sure there is some protections in there, at least for the schools that would like those protections. So. Okay, so with that, I, I would entertain a, a motion, uh, Jennifer. Sure, thanks. Um, I move that pursuant to Act 176, Section 4, subparagraph D3, the State Board approves the subcommittee's draft preparedness statement 
as the State Board of Education's final written advisory statement detailing the factors underlying its conclusion that there is a, quote, reasonable risk, end quote, that the Ripton School District will not be able to be prepared by July 1st, 2023 to assume the responsibilities of a standalone supervisory district, a school district within a yet-to-be-established supervisory union, or a school district that is a member of an existing supervisory union. Now, you've heard um, the motion. Is there a second? It's been seconded by Kim Gleason. Is there any further discussion? Okay, not hearing any. Um, all those in favor of adopting the mo mo oh, is, is that a no? Okay, all those in favor of uh, uh, adopting uh, the motion as stated, uh, please signify by saying yes and raising your hand. Yes. 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 Okay. And those opposed, please signify by saying no and raising your hand. Are there any abstentions? It appears that the motion has carried unanimously. The motion has indeed carried uh, unanimously and, and you've um, adopted um, the uh, the report. So we will. Um, uh, we'll finalize uh, the report. There's one uh, blank section in there just to note the vote and uh, pursuant to Act 176 will uh, will post this and distribute um, to the um, Ripton School District. So um, with that, that's a good uh, segue into item L, uh, which is just to have a uh, discussion on um, sort of prep discussion, continued discussion, if you will. We started this, as you may recall, back in June, uh, discussion around Addison County governance issues in general. And as we sort of previewed uh, what was hap what was happening uh, back in June, you know, there were um, and, and still are a number of variables. Um, Ripton um, is, uh, is certainly one variable. We also had the Starksboro uh, withdrawal. Um, so I, uh, I I do want to highlight for uh, the board's benefit that uh, the ratification vote was held on Tuesday, um, and that uh, that failed. So the Starksboro uh, withdrawal effort has uh, come to uh, to an end, um, unless um, there is some sort of a uh, petition to reconsider, which could happen at any point within the next. 30 days, so we won't have finality on that until that 30 day window um, closes. But for the moment, um, uh, the voters within the Mount Abe Supervisory District have uh, declined to release Starksboro. So we essentially at this point now have um, Ripton, which, you know, Looks like it could potentially be returning ACSD, and that leave, leaves Lincoln. Um, so we've asked for uh, Jennifer Samuelson, uh, following the July meeting, did send a, a, a note off to the Lincoln School District asking for um, its thoughts on, um, you know, its preferred configuration and and sort of where things stand with their uh, their preparations, etc. So hopefully we'll have some information. Um, relative to that. Um, we've also received comments. I had reached out to the neighboring uh, supervisory unions in the region. Um, I did this week receive uh, written uh, comments, uh, which I've shared with uh, with everyone and are posted on our website. Uh, the net of it is that those SUs um, um, are opposed to having any of these uh, um, these districts assigned to them, um, they they do not support that uh, for a variety of reasons, and they've outlined um, those reasons. So we will have, um, you know, we have some new information here to continue to digest. But you know, as I reflect back on where we were at in in June, where we were potentially looking at at um, at Starksboro leaving MAUSD, um, and and what that might mean in terms of an SU configuration, 
I personally was of a mind, and I think others were as well, and Secretary French, I think you alluded to this in, in your um, your uh, recommendation with respect to the Addison Northwest and MAUSD proposed merger that sort of continued fragmentation at the will of the voters within, you know, that that particular supervisory district might suggest that there is um, uh, voter support for an SU configuration. And I note that in materials that the Mount A supervisory district board provided to the electorate in advance of Tuesday's election, they identified a number of, um, of issues for the voters to consider. And one of those issues, in addition to the financial and educational impacts was the potential um, that they um, uh, saw of them being deconstructed into an SU. So had the voters gone a different way, we could interpret that as, as you know, voters supporting the deconstruction of MAUSD. But I think in view of uh, the outcome of um, that vote on Tuesday, you know, I think that further reinforces the position, you know, that we have held as a board that, um, you know, if a if a district clearly expresses a desire not to be deconstructed, as was the case with both ACSD and with Mount Abe, uh, the Mount Abe Ace, uh, board, and in, in at least indirectly, sort of affirmed by its electorate, um, you know deconstruction of a supervisory district, in, in my view, is, is not a particularly um, appealing option. Um, nonetheless, we're going to have to figure out how to deal with uh, at least Lincoln, potentially Ripton, uh, depending on what happens with Ripton. Um, but given our findings in our review of Ripton, which extended to this proposed SU that Ripton had um, had offered with the full support, um, unqualified support of, of the Lincoln School District um, uh, is going to lead to some difficult conversations at our meeting next month. So with that laid out, um, board members, questions, comments? Jennifer, I think I see your hand up. Yeah, I'm just thinking um, we had talked about having this conversation at our September board meeting, um, given that we're looking at some school districts that have been or were expecting to go live by July 1st, 2023. I'm wondering, though, if Ripton warns its vote, that vote will most likely occur after our September board meeting. It's It sounds that way. So we may need to begin preparing for some sort of um, we, we may have some conditional decisions to make. And 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 in the case of Ripton, I think we need to remember we already made the decision on Ripton in January. So um, we don't necessarily need to make a decision. With respect True. To and I guess what I was getting at is, you know, I think Ripton and Lincoln were always sort of thinking that they might form their own supervisory union. Um, that option definitely falls away if Ripton um, decides to rejoin the ACSD, which then really does leave Lincoln by itself. Yep, exactly. But we've also concluded, you know, I, I, th you know, I think our findings are pretty clear that that proposed SU is, a, is just, is not realistic. Um, Kim? I was going to sort of highlight that in our findings, there was no no scenario in the third, you know, the SD on its own is not viable, the SU as proposed not viable, um, and certainly not in the timeline offered um, the fractional uh, proposed fractional employees, the licensure issues. There were there were no shortage of reasons for which that was not a viable solution. Um, I I can't help but feel that um, Lincoln's insistence on a vote prior to the um, the signing of the change in unification took 
options off the table for them. So I am not exactly sure what is left for options, either for them or are within our responsibility to do with respect to their school district. I don't, I don't know if you know, Oliver or Donna, what our options are. We, or we have, we have our pool boxes pretty, pretty empty at the moment. So I think where I see this headed, um, and for us to start thinking about as we head towards September is, I, I think, depending on whole, how all these, you know, Ripton plays out, et cetera, that this is going to be something that we need to refer to the legislature. This this is going to require legislative action to deal with because there, we simply don't have the tools. And again, unfortunately, they spent considerable time in crafting session law to address specifically Lincoln's situation. And um, consequently, given the timeline of the legislature reconvening and the need to put a budget before the voters in Lincoln, I'm just I'm perplexed and I know I don't I don't even know what recourse exists. So to Jennifer's question, like what I'm sure before we need to make a decision, options will be outlined for us. It is not obvious to me. I'll, I'll be. I'll be even more blunt and direct than I normally am. That move earlier this year was um, reckless and irresponsible. And um, it's, I, I don't know how this is going to end, but um, there's not much we can do. So I was afraid of <laughs> um, other other comments or questions on where things stand in Addison County. Grateful for the um, passion of those in their communities and the the work to try and understand a path that's different yep. um, and hoping it also allowed for a greater appreciation. I know certainly even having served on school boards and for so many years, the appreciation of the regulatory requirements of operating a school district and a supervisory district, supervisory union are not um, just a layer of management to be dispensed with, but rather um, the infrastructure that can allow smaller schools to thrive. That became very apparent in the course of um, the experts we brought to talk to us about whether the report laid out a path that seemed to reflect the requirements. Um, that certainly led us to a, an, a conclusion that was obvious, but I think um, I'm also hopeful that it brought to the attention of maybe everybody what is involved with um, the requirements and supports of a central office staff so that those educators on the ground closest to our kids can do their work and feel supported in doing so. So that I just, I highlight that as being a takeaway that I think is valuable for all of us. No, and I, I just, um, again, you know, the folks from, um, if the self-selected representatives from Lincoln had not done what they did, um, they would have been under these very carefully constructed provisions within Act 176 that would have given them the ability um, to delay operations uh, which would have provided, every, you know, provided them and others with um, with more time to to think about this. And that was a consistent theme we heard from the experts um, who testified before our, our committee on the Ripton status report was that, you know, this is a, a multi year process and trying to do this um, this much work uh, would require more time. Uh, but because they um, chose to take the expedited path and get out in front of the law, 
they lock themselves into this um, unrealistic date. Um, and they also uh, took away, and this is the thing that I find really very uh, troubling, they took away from their voters um, the opportunity to have the off ramp that Ripton um, has. And that really puts um, the, the folks in Lincoln in, in a, a really uncomfortable position, but most importantly, and the thing that um, really makes me pretty upset is um, the impact, the potential impact that has on students. I agree, Oliver, and I think um, a piece we really didn't touch on, but that is um, the ability to finance or fund through the electorate, a transition funding, borrowing, all matters that would be necessary to stand up a district under any circumstances. And um, that seems not to have been planned for. I mean, it truly, um, I know Ripton had thought they had an avenue for that. It seemed that was not sort of allowed for in the way it was structured. So there are just, we recognize there to be some challenges that may require us to recommend changes to the law, but we just simply, um, I, yeah, I, I feel frustrated for the situation um, and concerned for the outcome. So um, to be continued next month um, somewhere uh, in, well, we'll probably be in a few different locations in Addison County. Um, so unless there's anything else, um, I think we can actually move on to item N, which is uh, uh, public to be heard, um, unless there's anything else on um, about our September meeting. Again, the reminder to please uh, complete the doodle poll so we can lock in a date for that. Um, so public to be heard, or do we have any members of the public who wish to address us? Oh, Patrick, before we move on to public. Sorry, I um, was just going to put something on your plate for consideration for the September meeting. This yes. morning, Secretary French mentioned the um, school safety presentation, and I wonder if you would consider that for the September meeting in Addison, if I don't know how much time he would need. Yeah, I certainly, uh, Patrick, have put that on my list. I'm going to reach out to our folks. I'll I'll have uh, the school safety center uh, prepare a presentation. I'm not sure it would be September or not, but we'll, okay. we'll have them come speak to the board, assuming the chair would find that useful. Thank yep. you. Yep, I agree. That makes sense. Thank you, Patrick. Right. Um, already, uh, public to be heard. Are there any members of the public who wish to be heard? If you are a member of the public and would like to address the board, you can um, raise your hand. I see somebody just put their hand up. Uh, let me see who that, this is. Uh, so there's a phone number dialing in ending 01. Um, Suzanne, if you wouldn't mind unmuting them. Actually, I think I can unmute maybe. Uh, Yes, I think we can hear you, whoever's dialed in. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Hi there, um, my name is Jeannie Cash. Um, I'm a resident of Ripton, um, also the Ripton school bus driver for the past three years. And I just wanted to take this opportunity today as kind of, it feels somewhat like a last chance to speak, which I've been following along, mostly hanging with Steve and I's now five-year-old, um, soon-to-be kinder kindergartner at the Ripton School, um, at least for one year, if not more, hopefully. Um, I'd like to say that as somebody who got plugged in, we, we moved to Ripton in 2018, and we... Um, when I took the role as school bus driver, 
our social network greatly expanded kind of exponentially um, not having a kid in in school yet and I won't pretend to speak for the entire community of Ripton which is um, at its most populous point in Ripton's history currently but I I will just speak to um, the fact that within my conversations around town currently, there there seems to be an understanding that if the State Board of Ed deems us, the Ripton School District, um, not to be able and ready to be our own supervisory district, which it has, um, then the State Board's role of education is to place us within an existing supervisory union, which it was never stated that's a will that has to be a willing supervisory union that get we get placed with or any withdrawing school gets placed with it's it's either a stand up supervisory district on its own or um, an existing supervisory union and um, I feel like the elephant in the room that has somewhat been discussed but not totally just brought to full attention is that without some protection for rural school closure, um, there exists the real potential for the town, a town, our town, to vote to stay the course and push onward um, because as the off-ramp has been coined, um, around town, it's known as the poison pill because it essentially sticks us back to where we originally were, which is in a very, very vulnerable place within Addison Central School District. Um, which is, I think, what Mark Ottinger is trying to line up with to ensure a vote is successful and off-ramp is taken um, if the state board has power or power of suggestion for Addison Central School District to um, amend its articles to offer some protection to small schools. Not that they can't ever close them, but that it puts the voice and the power in the people of the town. Weybridge voted not to withdraw. There, there exists, people don't want to keep their schools open if they need to be closed, but they want to have a say. And that is originally what Ripton set out for, was a voice in the matter. Um, and if Addison Central knew that the alternative was that they were going to be reverted back to a supervisory union, um, maybe there would be a better chance for an amendment to the articles and Ripton townsfolk to vote in the affirmative to return. Um, I'm, I'm curious, um, the state board always wanted Ripton School District to have a contingency plan. What's your contingency plan? What's your contingency plan? And I haven't heard what the state board's contingency plan is for the event that Ripton does not vote to return to Addison Central and take this off ramp. I'm not saying that that is what's going to happen, but I know there's a lot of passionate people in this town who have, who have belief that we could go it alone. And um, I'm just curious, I know you probably won't respond, but um, to what your contingency plan is for that situation. Thanks for hearing me out. I hope the connection was all right. And thank you for all your time. Have a good day. Great. Thank you, your, your connection was fine. We heard all of that. So um, we okay. appreciate you taking the time. Um, are there other members of the public who wish to address the board? 
if so, if you're on the line uh, you, uh, dialed in, you can press star five uh, to to be recognized. If you're in the Teams meeting, you can uh, raise your hand. I'm not seeing any hands go up. Um, so I think with that, um, I would uh, entertain a, a motion to adjourn. OK, it's been moved by Jennifer Samuelson. Is there a second? Seconded by Patrick. It's been seconded by Patrick. Um, all those in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying yes and raising your hand. Yes. 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 Okay. Those opposed. Yes. Those opposed, please signify by saying no and raising your hand. It appears that um, we have voted unanimously to adjourn. Thank you all, um, and we'll speak soon. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Right. Thank you. Thank you.